When we decide to say, hey, enough is enough, enough will be enough. Yes, sir. A lot of times we don't want the responsibility mm. of running things on our own because we think, a lot of us think we kind of got it made. We mm. can just kind of laugh, joke, dance, let white people take care of the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. We think we got a little good, a good deal going on right yeah. now. But we also understand if we get the white supremacists out of here, who's going to run the waterworks system? See, mm. now we can't be clubbing mm. and lollygagging. We got to get up at six in the morning. So we want managers. Right, right. See, we want, we think those are cool little managers. They do that. We can do our little lollygagging and jerking around. We got to get down to serious business because look, the white supremacists are going to die off, unfortunately, because their numbers are dwindling. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I, mean, I, I see. I, I give, I give like raw racism. Yeah. 20, 30 years. Yeah. It, it's not going to be it's, around. It's be I, I tell black people yeah. this. They're not going to be running stuff too much longer. Just by nature. Yeah. Okay. Nature is going to, you know, handle that unfortunately or fortunately however you want to look at it we're going to have to start running stuff and getting into the habit mm. of who's going to run them satellites up in the right. sky who's going to run the power grids who's going to do the non-pretty work mm. you see? so you said we right at this point we dependent yeah Peace family is 19 Keys and we're here for another high level conversation. Today I am joined with a very powerful, necessary pillar of our community, of our culture, of the entire diaspora. This brother is very necessary. I've had conversations with people across the world and one thing that they've told me that I've always found interesting is a lot of Africans say that black people in America taught us how to be African. They taught us more about African history than we ever learned from our parents or from the continent. And often that's because we are in the search for ourselves. And in that search, we find everybody's history because the bloodline of black America is through all the bloodlines of the world because we're mixed in, we've been moved around. There's so many things that have happened. So we are a new people, if you will. Now, in that being a new people, we often don't feel grounded especially being in America, we feel displaced. We feel a lack of connection. The power that the brother Tariq Nasheed has with his career over time with delivering us hidden colors is he brought to light a lot of the narratives that we never knew, a lot of the heroes, the unsung heroes, the stories that was never shared because we were stuck in a indoctrination system that they call education. So that unlearning process, whether you're conscious, whether you're unconscious, whether you're of the initiator, you're just getting initiated, a lot of people can go through that whole caliber of catalog that he has from one through five, and they can learn a complete new story about the real time and what happened here. The myth of white civilization being at the root of civilization is the biggest lie that has ever been told. And with the gathering of the scientists and the scholar that Brother Tariq Nasheed has done, has given black America a gift, the gift of education, the gift of knowledge of self, and the gift of history. Not only that, he is an advocate on the front line of reparations. Run me my check. Y'all know y'all owe me some money. You know what I'm talking about? And until we get that money, we're going to continue to press on the next of the oppressors and those who privilege. You understand me? Off our hard work, sweat, and equity because we are from this country because this is our country because we built it. Therefore, we actually own it. Now it's time for us to claim it. So I appreciate this brother being here. Before he was even a scholar, he was a Mac. You know what I'm talking about? So he definitely knows how to communicate in a way to where the world can understand exactly the necessity of foundational black Americans. Brother, I appreciate you being here. My man. brother, man, it's my pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Man, I want to get back right, right into it, man. Um, history is often told by the victors. Mm. The victors, depending on, you know, their moral situation, they could be the oppressors, mm -hmm. right? In America, we know the story of our oppressors. Mm -hmm. We don't know the story of those who fought against that oppression. Mm -hmm. We don't know what their lives were like. We don't really understand what it's like to have even pride in being a black American unless it's looked at as more of like a, a Republican thing lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? But when it comes to the reality of the black American gods, if you will, and I was listening to a publication and it was saying that um, it was on black magic. He was talking with his sister, I think her name is 
or Sister Isis or something of that nature. And it's talking about you got the Egyptian gods, mm -hmm. which is nice to understand that. But then you also have the black gods that are the black American gods, if you will, where, you know, Egypt was not just in or, or, or Kemet. I would say, and Kimmy, I'm talking about more so that mindset of things that we built was not just in, you know, uh, Northern Africa or in Egypt, mm -hmm. but we built here. There are pyramids here. There's pyramids and there's, you know, um, mummies that have been found in America, 12,000 year old mummies mm -hmm. and pyramids that's been found here in America. So why don't you think that we know of course, I know this answer, but I want, I want to hear yours. Why don't you think that we know how special we are in America? They have to create a narrative that we are guests in our own country. Mm. The narrative that we were just brought over here to a new country by white people, um, our history was stripped from us, and we were slaves, and white people felt the kindness of their heart to free us, and we had the civil rights movement and then a black president. That's the narrative that they want to give us because that disempowers us. That mm. makes us feel like we can't do anything unless we get the approval of a white person. Mm. That's the common thing. If you go to the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C., that is really the whole theme of it. When you walk through history, you see slavery, civil rights, and they got a big picture of Obama at the very end. That's not all about history. We are the culture of America. Mm. The good thing about us is that we can claim African history because genetically we are African people. We can claim Kemet. We can claim all of the great rulers that, that occurred in Africa. We can claim the Moors. That's a part of our bloodline as well. What makes us unique is the history here in the Americas because the United States was built by foundational black Americans. Mm -hmm. There was no United States until we built it. We have a very special claim here because every part of the culture here we either created it or we influenced it. That's a fact. And many of our accomplishments are erased or given to other people. When we say the term African-American, which is a term that was popularized in 1988 by mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson. Mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson and the Boule and the Congressional Black Caucus had a press conference at a hotel in Chicago at the behest of the white Democratic Party and they said, Black Americans now want to be labeled African Americans because we want to be grounded in, in a motherland and they started pro to promote the term African American. They did this not to give us a cultural relevance because we already had a cultural relevance here. Mm -hmm. This is our culture. What they wanted to do was make us comparable to immigrants. So an African American is no different from a Hispanic American, which is no different from an Arab American, which is no different from a Chinese American. So the narrative becomes all of you minority groups contributed to the greatness of America. Right. So when we give something to black people, let's give it to all minorities because mm -hmm. you're all equal. Right. That was a trick bag. And they do that right now. Whenever we start talking about reparations, which we deserve, well, all people suffered. Mm. All people experience racism. Right. So we have to stop that narrative. And this is why the foundation of black American movement is taking hold so strongly right now because we're claiming our specific lineage. No disrespect to anybody else, right. but we have a unique lineage as people who descended from the slaves who built this country, who were the foundation of this country. Right. No other group. Other groups left their homeland to come here to benefit off of what foundational black Americans built. That's a fact. That, these are just facts. No disrespect to nobody. Now, what about the, so what about the narrative of us also being Native Americans, mm -hmm. right? Specifically in the case of basically saying that most of melanated people in America, when I say melanated, I'm just being politically correct, right? right? Just to include you know, the way uh, various groups of black people categorize ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So let's say the melanated people here, right? The brown people, right? Dark brown people, copper color. We're here already when a white man gets here. Mm -hmm. Christopher Columbus never stepped a foot on America, mm -hmm. right? So we know that he, he never discovered anything, but when he got lost, right? Um, and his peoples got lost over here, right? They seen that we was already here, we was thriving, we had our, our tribal and nomadic ways of living, mm -hmm. right? And there was already uh, African um, explorers who came over here already doing trade and things of that nature, right? And so 
within that, there was already populations of people that were here, mm -hmm. right? Now, we know that the Native Americans, of course, were slaughtered, mm -hmm. right? Because the white man wanted to take claim of America. Mm -hmm. But when you do trace root genealogy and people go look at their family history and they do one of those tests, they're gonna be like, wait a minute, my family was here, which also gives me rights under these treaties in America, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the most, I think, um, uh, uh, um, uh, highest forms of argument that I hear is that black people can't get reparations because specifically of the word black, mm -hmm. that it's not a nationality. So what then do you say to that particular argument? Because I'm 100%, 1,000% for reparations. I just want to know, do we have to do we have to change the language in order for the law to be written? No, we don't have to change the language. This whole thing where you have to have a flag that's recognized by yeah. the UN and all of that stuff. Well, you have a rainbow flag that's not represented by the UN and LGBT white people get all types of money and benefits. Mm. Um, some of the Native American tribes, they, these were tribes that were named by the Spanish. When the Spanish came along and saw a bunch of different tribes living among the Creek area, they said, well, you guys are Creek Indians. Yeah. When they saw some Native Americans and black Aboriginal people living together, they said, those look like runaways. And the word for runaway at the time was Cimarron. So they called them Cimarrons, which turned into Seminole. Yeah. So these names come from these different places and the names vary, but these people are compensated. Mm -hmm. um, we can get compensation without having to do all of this crazy paperwork because they owe us. We're supposed to get what we're supposed to get. And going back to the whole narrative about us um, having some black Aboriginal people here, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, when all of the European explorers came here, Columbus's brother, um, Bizarro, Balboa, every single one of them said that they saw black-skinned people here who looked like the same people who were in Africa, mm -hmm. almost every single one of them. We get the notion that a Native American is the mongoloid-looking person, which is just one variation of the aboriginal people here. They would use the red-skinned natives many times to be pitted against the black skin aboriginals. Mm. They were the ones who were helping to capture some of the black skin Native Americans and aboriginals. And then at one point, they started to redefine some of the natives who were black skin and called them Negro. Mm -hmm. This is very well documented. Then going into the 1900s, they had something called the Dolls Rose, where they had a census where they were gonna take track of all of the Native Americans and the aboriginal people the black people, they just labeled them freedmen or Negro, and white people who wanted to get some of the benefits of being a Native American paid money under the table. They paid $5 to get listed on the census form. Mm -hmm. And that's where the term $5, $5 Indian, Indian yeah. comes from. Most of the, people, or the people claiming Native American that you see are white people who ain't got now drop a damn Native American blood in them. This is a fact. This is a super fact. fact. I think, uh, what's, the, what's the tribe? I don't want to get it wrong. The tribe, they, they're out there in the South Hamptons. Mm -hmm. They're the only black, like fully black tribe that Sint you go. Sint Shintikok? Yeah, the Shinnecock Nation. Yeah, yeah. So they invited me up there. I went to go speak to some of them. And uh, they're the only tribe that has never left their land, so they never lost it. So their land is not in the treaty of the United States government. Mm. It's in their own treaty, so they have true sovereignty, yes, right? Um, and so it, 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 it perplexes me that when you go up there, it's, this is a real, right next to the Hamptons, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. then they hate, them rich people hate them over there because they got real true sovereign claim to the land mm -hmm. but they're as dark as you and darker than me mm -hmm. some are lighter right mm -hmm. but most of them are dark-skinned black people i think flavor flavors is the, yeah. descended from that tribe. Yeah. Like, yeah. Old Dirty Bastard was yep, descended exactly. from that tribe. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah. but but we get this notion in our head that they look like, you know, um, Mexicans, right. you know, modern day Mexicans as they do today. Mm -hmm. So that, that skew that's in our head of history is just wrong. Because when we think about our story and time, what was happening during that time, we think about the modern Hollywood actors, right, that are played as Native Americans. Right. We don't think of Old Dirty Bastard. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We don't think of Flavor Flav, mm -hmm. right? We don't mm -hmm. think of somebody that looks like you and I. Mm -hmm. So we don't even think to dig and look into that, right? And what's interesting, a lot of black artists back in the day, they would acknowledge their native ancestry. Mm -hmm. Chuck Berry had native ancestry. Yeah. James Brown had native yeah. ancestry. Take a good look at James Brown. Yeah. You, you, you dig? Take a real good look yeah. at him. You can see it. Yeah. Johnny uh, Mathis, yeah. that's another one. So Michael many of Jackson them would look like yeah. he probably did too. Yeah, yeah. 
The Jackson family does. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. He was part Native American. Look at how he dressed. He would dress like a Native American when you yeah. look back at how That's he dressed. That's a fact. With the fringes and stuff. Yes, indeed. So we knew. We've always known that. Yeah. We've always had that that camaraderie with that ancestry, and. In the Jim Crow era, there was a man named Walter Plecker, who was a part of the Vital Statistics Office in Virginia. They started doing paper genocide. They would look at black people, look at their birth records, and anybody who looked like they could have any black ancestry, they would reclassify them as Negro. Mm. Whatever tribe they were from, like, nah, his nose is too big, Negro. Lips too big, Negro. And they would do this all up into the 1960s. Mm. The Loving versus the State of Virginia case, where they did that movie about the black woman marrying this white man, she's really a Native American. Mm. A lot of folks don't know that. I want y'all to look that case up. That's really a Native American. She's a, an Aboriginal person. But she was reclassified as a Negro. So that paper genocide is a real thing. Absolutely. And that's why we, we, we really, our history is so entangled. Yeah. You understand me? And it's kind of, you got to go in there and release the knots. Yeah. Like when I study John Horse, yeah. and I'm looking at how, number one, his story is incredible. Yes, it is. The man fought multiple war fronts, mm -hmm. right? He fought against America. He fought for America, mm -hmm. right? He fought on the side of the Seminole Indians. He was mm -hmm. given his freedom in Florida. Mm -hmm. Then it was took him back. Right, and then he ended up going missing in somewhere in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But when I think about the significance of that, it's like, of course, we don't, they, 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 you want to teach this in American history school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They talk about critical race theory and things of that nature, but that doesn't even go deeper enough to expose, because well, American history has to be exposed, not yeah. just taught. Yeah. That's, this is the reality of it, it has to be an expose on, wait a minute, this black man was directly, and then, you know, when you go into that history, you see that the Indians had, or the Native Americans had their own form of slavery as well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't chattel slavery, but they own blacks as well. Mm -hmm. So when you expose that, you're going to see lineage, though. You're yeah. going to see children. You're going to see marriages, mm -hmm. right? And then you're going to say, wait a minute, this is my family right here. Mm -hmm. My family is traced back here. Your government made a deal for this land that my family lineage would own this. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we don't need you to know your story. We're not going to teach this in school. We don't want you to start having claim to rights to land. We spent this whole last 100 years trying to steal all your land from your people. Exactly. And going, and going into John Horse, that was a phenomenal brother. That was one of the greatest military leaders in American history. Yes. That's never talked about. This was a brother who was down there in Florida fighting in the Seminole War. And they've always made the Seminole War seem like it was a Native American against the, <coughs> the right. government. Even they at the time said, this is a Negro War. Mm -hmm. We can lie later, which is what they're doing now. But they said when they were fighting, we got to stop playing. These are Negroes and they're beating the brakes off of mm -hmm. us because they don't want to be on no plantation and they're fighting to the death. It was black people down in Florida burning down plantations. They halted the slave um, business down in Florida. Mm -hmm. They were freeing people, slaughtering the white generals and the white U.S. Army um, uh, military personnel. Yeah. Um, many of those counties down there are named after the white people who were slaughtered. Dade was slaughtered by some mm. of those black Seminoles. Dade County is named after him. The Seminoles went in there, the brothers, which I call the Maroons, because that's what they were. They were living in the swamps. Yeah. They hopped out on Dade and slaughtered like a hundred of his guys. Yeah. Um, they made a treaty with the United States saying that they could get their freedom if right. they chose to move out of Florida. So they fought and won their freedom. They never frame it like that. Mm -hmm. They got their freedom and they were told they got to move to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of the black Seminoles ended up in Oklahoma. Some of the, the Redskin natives were trying to enslave them. So they mm -hmm. said, oh, well, let, let's, let's go down to Mexico. We, we got to deal with them down there. They'll let us come down here and chill because we were working with the Spanish in Florida. We're still cool with some of the Spanish folks. So they went down to Mexico. The black Seminoles, they were supposed to protect the border, which is what they did. They protected the border from the Comanche Indians. And they were going back and forth. After slavery, they would come back. They would work with the U.S. Army. They became the Buffalo Soldiers. Mm. They came all the way out here in the West. It was those black Buffalo Soldiers who were really Seminole Maroons who were the first park rangers. All of the national parks that we see in, in the West, yeah. they were the ones helping to clear the brush and build the structures in these parks mm -hmm. and to make to maintain them and make sure that they weren't being vandalized. It was black park rangers doing that. Mm. We were the first people who were working in the mail service in the United States, the Pony Express. You couldn't have white people riding horses in 
hostile areas with these Native Americans. Yeah. They would have gotten killed and scalped. Yeah. They had to get black folks to do it. It was black folks riding those horses. I mean, even this our history with horses and being the first, you know, cowboys, cowboys. and Lone Ranger and things of that nature. Our history is so, like, they, they, they took, you know, it's, it's brilliant when you think of how they steal and then uh, um, they remake history. And you brought up the Lone Ranger. That ties in, too. Yeah. The Lone Ranger is based on Bass Reeves, a foundational black American who was enslaved. He was in Texas. He beat up his slave owner, <clears throat> got his freedom, went to live with the black Seminoles in Oklahoma, eventually became a lawman, very well respected. He had um, um, a Native American sidekick, a red Native American sidekick. When Hollywood got that story, they turned the Lone Ranger into a white man, yeah. still kept Tonto, the red Native American. Yeah. Yeah. But the they, uh, story was so bad, yeah. man. When you they they basically like, man, no, nah, we can't. When we tell this story, we gotta say he was white. White. They had to white them up. We'll give him a black mask, but we'll just yeah. be white. That you, black mask was representing his black skin. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was the, a symbolic thing. Yeah, you know? it was symbolic. But yeah. that's that's amazing how, you know, you, now they, they complaining about Ariel being black, and I don't care oh. about that because she not gonna be dating no black man, so exactly. that don't have no value yeah, to it. Yeah, the me. mermaid and when we go into mermaids, mermaids have been um, myths in Africa for years. There's been myths all over Africa mm -hmm. about mermaids and, and, and people living in the sea. Right. And, yeah, so that's old. And even the, the, the brothers on some of the coasts that can dive underwater and they can hold their breath for extremely long time periods mm -hmm. and they can literally go swimming and you know, it, it, it would make sense if there was any myths of mermaids that they would be melanated people. Of course. You understand course. me? I think we get it confused because you look at, um, what's that fast swimmer the, the baby smoking the weed. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. Yeah. So yeah. now in the Olympics make the face of, you know, uh, um, you know, great swimmers is white. Mm -hmm. But black people have always been great divers and swimmers. This mm -hmm. is where we, we always played in that water. And mm -hmm. I think the myth being spread around that black people can't swim right. is what takes our mind out of that, mm -hmm. right? But the reality of it is in every story and every myth, whether you're going to Greek, whether you're going to Roman, whether Whatever story you come up with, the antithesis of that is made around a black body, mm -hmm. a black being, right? A black character. Mm -hmm. And so they started mythologizing all the incredible things that they seen us do. And they couldn't help but tell the story because this was like TV back in the day. Mm -hmm. Man, I seen this black man pick up a 3,000 ton boulder. Now you got stories of Hercules, mm -hmm. right? But you can't tell this story like it's a black man. Everybody in the lands know this story, mm -hmm. right? This is a white man that, that was this physique, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right? So you got the Olympics today, but we know that in every sport we dominate. Mm -hmm. That Olympic stuff is, is for them to try to prove themselves against us mm -hmm. because we have always been incredible at every single thing that we've done. Yeah, and them having to whitewash everything. Um, off camera, we're talking about Hannibal Barker. Yes. Um, when you look at um, history series, they always try to whiten him up. Yeah. You, you, there could not be a white Hannibal because Hannibal had African elephants. To this day, African elephants really can't be tamed. That's and a fact. if somebody tames them, it has to be a black person. Yeah. So there was not a European riding those African elephants yeah. into those mountains. Hell no. Nah. Logically impossible. First of all, they would him if you could tell because Hannibal Barker would be celebrated more if he was really white. Right. 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 That, that's the reason that you don't hear about him. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes now you hear about it from black historians. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Because we know that we're telling our story. Mm -hmm. Right. But otherwise they would praise him the same way to praise Napoleon, the same way to praise Julius Caesar and mm -hmm. all of these other different people. But he's not thrown in that round table of names. Exactly. Right. But they so they like, no, we're not going to tell the story because then people go dive deep into it too much. And then they're going to start seeing the more ancient coins with his image exactly. on them, with elephants on uh, the back. And then they always got some stupid reason on why, you know, every everywhere they go, we're painted black, we have black features, mm -hmm. and then they always come up with a reason why this had to be black or why the features were shown this way. Right. Right. When, um, but when you look at Hannibal Barker, I think his story is a representation of our genius, mm -hmm. specifically from um, us being military genius. Yes, indeed. Because we're always painted as a very peaceful, easily conquered people. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is we are the follow of military strategy, mm -hmm. right? And through Hannibal Barker, you see a representation of that, him taking 100,000 men and losing 80 percent of that and still conquering a one million man army, mm -hmm. right? And being the only person to conquer Rome. 
So that is a powerful story that if you start a child off with that story of their history, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, that's where I come from? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can handle anything. No, but if you take and you start their story, you were weak, bonded, and in chains, mm -hmm. right? Then it's like, damn, I feel bad for myself. Right. 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 So like where your story starts matters because that's where you begin your narrative of who you are and what you are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So I can understand why they like, all right, we gotta whitewash this, we gotta whitewash that, we gotta change the features here. Everything has to be changed because it's gonna be very hard for you to dominate a people who have the largest population on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. You have to separate them, number one. You have to have all of them speak a different language. They have to have all different details and accounts of what history is. Mm -hmm. They can never see themselves as one because we would never be able to conquer them as one because we are the minority. Absolutely. So with whites being the minorities and blacks being the majority on this planet Earth, they can only psychologically beat us, right? Because this is the only thing, and this, this happens in, through all our societies, right? You see the majority is always conquered by the minority. Mm. That's the reality everywhere on the planet Earth. Mm. And so you wonder what subdues these people from just rising up, right? It's a spiritual and psychological warfare right. that's played upon those people. And we don't understand how much they study us, going back to, to Hannibal and the elephants. Remember the elephants, that was the prototype for military tanks mm -hmm. with the trunk and the, the, the big body. And yeah. The, the tusk and yeah. all of that, that's the military. Yeah. They've always studied us. And even some of the maroon uprisings, they study that in military school now. Yeah. Um, and they put it in movies. For yeah. example, the black maroons down in Florida and on the East Coast, because black people were, were living in swamps doing sneak attacks against the white supremacists. One thing that the maroons would do, they would wear red bandanas. Mm. And they would have something called the, the bloody flag. They would raise a red flag. Always look out for the, the bandanas because that was something that the Moors were wearing too. Moors back in Europe would have those red bandanas. That represented fire and war. When you look at movies like Rambo, where Rambo is this character fighting as if he's a, a maroon. He's fighting in the swamp all the time. Mm. He's always wearing a red bandana. Yeah. You, you dig? Mm. They get all of these symbolisms from us. They know what they're doing and right. they give little winks and nods to each other. They study everything we do and then formulate that into their culture as if they came up with it. See, that's powerful when we talk about the swamps. And I was listening to an interview with you and y'all was talking about, you know, um, voodoo, yes. right? And how, you know, we utilized the swamps because we were masters of it, mm -hmm. right? And we knew that they weren't masters of it and we can beat them in that particular terrain. Mm -hmm. But specifically when it comes to voodoo, voodoo is seen as, you know, um, as what's the word I'm looking for? you know, uh, a bad thing, essentially, right, right? right? And of course, you know, the dark arts and everything to black and dark is considered to be bad, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course, white magic is considered to be good. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, is we've been masters of the elements, right? And the, um, the spirit, our entire existence. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you don't get the Haitians winning, you don't get Nanny and the Maroons winning without them being able to utilize, right, the elements. That's all it is. Yes. Voodoo and all that, it's you connecting with nature and the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. That's all, because it's all the same. Right. But us understanding that in a real way, not white Jesus. <laughs> right. You, you dig? Yeah. Understanding that we are the essence, we are all of this stuff. We as melanated people are, we are nature. We are the spirit realm. All of it is connected and we can get our strength from that. And that's what they did in, in Haiti. And that scared the hell out of white people and it scares them now. That's why they made voodoo something negative. Yeah. Because what we started doing, we started getting in those swamps with those alligators where white people couldn't go into. Even here in, in the Americas, we would live around those wild animals because we were on the same page with them. We weren't afraid of them. Mm. We had a spiritual connection with them. Even in Africa today, you don't see a lot of African people getting attacked by the animals because they have a relationship right. spiritually with the animals. Yeah. Um, when we and our brothers and sisters were fighting these white supremacists using their voodoo system, that scared the white supremacists so much, they started making movies in the 1930s about zombies and yeah. black Haitians. Yeah. The early voodoo movies had Haitians in them, mm. them portraying Haitians. The word zombie, which the zombie genre is real big today, that comes from a, a Haitian man named Jean Zombie, mm. who was killing white people yeah. in um, Haiti during the revolution. Mm. After the revolution was over and they were getting the French out, it was this 
light-skinned slave, former slave named Jean Zombie, who was slaughtering the French. So his name became synonymous with terror. That's mm. where the word zombie comes from. So they've always been afraid of that. They taught us to be afraid of, yeah. of voodoo too. They taught us that it's witchcraft and it's right. evil. And then we start listening to the white supremacists and start forgetting our history and our essence because yeah. they've scared us out of it. Because it, it disconnects us. Right. If you want to, if you want to spiritually and psychologically control people and they have this connection to the element that empowers them, mm -hmm. you have to break that connection yes, first indeed. because that's going to give them confidence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now they're in harmony with mentalism, right? Mm -hmm. Now they know how to use the power of the mind. They know how to use everything around them that becomes a solution for whatever problem that they have. Mm -hmm. And then we go into alchemy, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Talking to my brother Idris Sandu was talking about the, the difference between like you got manifestors and then you have alchemists. Mm -hmm. Alchemists use what they have. Mm -hmm. The manifestor is trying is using mentalism to attract things into their reality to bring them forth. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the combination of those are very powerful, but as a people, we have the ability to transform any substance into the tool that we very needed to free ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you got a people who believe in systems of what we call magic, mm -hmm. right, which is really science and alchemy, mm -hmm. right? And knowing the ability of how to apply that and create weapons and, and use our own spiritual force and will, then that's impossible to conquer those people. Mm -hmm. And you see that through Haiti and then you see that through um, Nanny and the Maroons, and I want to talk to you about that because I know you have a project coming up. Mm -hmm. Now, I went out to Jamaica, mm -hmm. and I went up there, right, to the Maroon land, and yeah. I, I went to the grave site of Nanny, um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm deep on supreme mathematics and numerology, and she fought a 19-year war. Mm -hmm. So she, she one of them 19 keys, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And But the significance of her is very powerful in her story because, you know, there was this one particular story where the, 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 it was the British, right? Yeah. The British were scared of her because they believed she could uh, stop bullets, right, with her ass mm -hmm. or her, for, for the channel, her glutes, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but the story they say was is that she calculated the distance of how the bullet, how far the bullets could fly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so she marked in there in the dirt Mm -hmm. So when they get close, she'd stand there, turn around, right, and show her glutes, and then when they would shoot, it would stop right there before it hit her butt. Wow. 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 <laughs> so they wow. were they were afraid, like, yeah. wait a minute, is this no magic? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and she knew the terrain mm -hmm. so well that it was mm -hmm. gonna be impossible for them to defeat her. Mm -hmm. But the 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 beauty of when her story ends is that she she wins and she refuses to take any treaties from the queen, mm -hmm. and she goes back and become a gardener. Mm. And she lives a soft life. Yeah. And to me, that's the story of like, um, you know, uh, doing a 180, right? A woman masculizing herself into the logical warfare mm -hmm. to help her people get free and then going back into the harmony of her feminine energy, yes. right? And, and going back into softness. And so we have to learn, number one, there's no great revolution without black women, right? There's no nothing. But what is the end result? Our women have to be able to get back into their softness. Yes. Not to stay in a state of masculinity because mm -hmm. they had to masculize themselves for warfare. Right. Right. And right. that's what we're dealing with. So when a people go through economic warfare and they're in poverty, that is a state and a condition that the people must fight out of. Right. So right. if the black man is not standing there with the financial education, with the you know uh, ability to liberate themselves into wealth, mm -hmm. then the woman now, of course, we know how the tools put her in that position, but she's going to masculize herself to get out of that. Because state of poverty is not a state for human beings to live a quality of life. Absolutely. But we have to have a plan to say, okay, now our plan is to bring our women back into softness. And we have to understand that warfare is based on deception. Mm -hmm. What you just explained, the white supremacists know that too. Mm -hmm. They understand the importance of women to go back into their femininity and men to be into their masculine bag. This is why they are always promoting sexual confusion to black people. That's a fact. We can't get anything financed from the dominant society unless we say we have some questions about our sexuality, then mm. the money and the checks start rolling left That's and right. That's a fact. They got black men out here, and Dr. Welsing said this was gonna happen, she said this years ago. Black men are gonna stop sagging because sagging is really a form of femininity mm -hmm. because it, it's, it mask itself as right. masculine gang, gangster stuff, but really it comes out of prison right. and guys showing their asses to yeah. other men. She said eventually they're going to come out the sagging pants and start putting on dresses, and that's what we see now, and that's promoted 
all across the board towards us. When you look at hip hop award shows now, you got more dudes with dresses than women now. That's a fact. That's propaganda. So now you have black men being told to be more feminine. So naturally, that's going to make the women more masculine because mm -hmm. who's going to protect me? That's Not a this fact. nigga in a dress. Right. So we're being deliberately buck broken as a group. That's why I did a movie called Buck Breaking. Yeah. The buck breaking didn't just stop on the plantation. What does the word buck breaking mean? Buck for breaking them, like? comes from when slave owners would get a black male and they would call us bucks like an animal on mm -hmm. plantations. And if there was a strong, powerful black man who they need to demasculinize, they would sexually assault them on plantations. Mm -hmm. We have to break this buck. Yeah. Just like in prison, the whole thing where we're going to take somebody's manhood, that comes from the white supremacists yeah. that they have brought into the prison systems. Now. Right. That's we, a form of, 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 of spiritually, you know, um, conquering a person. It's 100 percent spiritual conquering. That's all it's about. If you can conquer somebody spiritually, you got them mentally and physically. Yes. You see? That's where you get with Dahmer in yeah. the whole, because cause it's, it's, it's two points. You know, one of them is a power where if you see somebody who has a power that you don't have, they believe that they can take that power. Mm -hmm. You understand me? By literally eating this person, mm -hmm. right? So they mm -hmm. would eat the flesh, right? There's, there's stories of, you know, European warriors eating the flesh of Africans mm -hmm. because here are these big body, strong Africans and they want that spiritual essence to come into them. Mm -hmm. And then so that goes into many ways to where there's a psychological aspect that happens. Dr. Wesley's talked about it when he said that showing us getting murdered on film a lot and us watching that effeminates us, yes. right? And it spiritually robs us because we constantly seeing ourselves lose, we constantly seeing ourselves, you know, oppressed, and it drains our testosterone. Even before television, when they would lynch black people, they would put it on postcards and send the postcards mm. of the lynchings all around the country. Yeah. So that's absolutely true. Yeah, that propaganda. That's, yes, that's the number one way to rule a people is through propaganda. Mm -hmm. Not physical anything, because they understand that they can psychologically embed images, self-identity of who you think you are. Mm -hmm. And if I can get you to think that you are a victim, not a warrior, you are a victim. Mm -hmm. So now when you go out there, in your mind is the narrative and the behavior of a victim, mm -hmm. not a warrior, mm -hmm. right? If I show you as Superman, yeah. if I show you as Black Panther, now you're gonna come out there with this new self image and the way that you respond is going to be representative of your self image. Mm -hmm. So no, it has to be psychologically damaging. You have to see a foot on your neck. So now you thinking, damn, in this situation, I'm gonna be just like that image I seen. Mm -hmm. So instead, we have to have a counter propaganda machine and counter intelligence that says that no, we're going to teach you who you are from a confidence standpoint, mm -hmm. from a warrior standpoint, from a king standpoint, from a military strategist standpoint, from a god standpoint. Yeah. None of these things that are damaging to you. Right. Every generation there exists tools to change the lives of those at the bottom class and at the top. These tools are things like the internet, or the printing press, or the light bulb. It represents innovation, paradigm shifts for generations to come. Those who have the education are able to take full advantage of the innovation by setting themselves up as the industry leaders, the most qualified and skilled, so where they can teach the world what's to come because they are the ones that build it. It's starting to feel like even though you have access to all this information, most people still don't know how, they to, don't use know how to use it. It's like the world is getting tested, but you need a cheat code in order to make sure that you pass it. People feel like the algorithm is against us. Well, what if I told you that we built the algorithm that was for you? In the block world order, it's about technology, it's about community, and it's about education. And giving you the opportunity to free yourself to make sure that you're not waiting on the next generation and the next tool and the next technology and the next update to be free. If you come on this journey and this ride with us, we'll make sure that you grow with us, you build with us in a manner to where you won't be left behind. Won't be left behind. There's perfection, and then there's greatness. Perfection is a state you reach, but it can never be consistent because the moment that you move is no longer in that same perfect state. Your goal is to reach greatness, but I want greatness to be normalized. Great. I don't want it to be something that only this 1% have access to. This new 1% that runs parallel to it are those who understand how to innately tap into their gifts. 
See, I look at the way that the world has been created and the way that the world has consistently been ran. When you have monarchies, Monarch they can just tell you that they bloodline are more world than everybody else. They create rules, they create seals, they put it on paper, and the rest of the world starts to follow that forever. Now that's power. It's not perfect, but it's great. Now we got new systems, blockchain. These systems sit there to challenge the existing system with new seals, new families, new records, new history can be created. But what does that matter if you're not educated and you're consistently distracted? They said because of social media, this new technology, it has actually made people more distracted and less focused. So therefore, they said the average person can only focus somewhere around seven to 10 seconds. Seven to 10 seconds. <laughs> now for me, I think that's terrible. The reason I think it's terrible because we have access to more information than any other people at any other point in time, yet we don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's value, and what's bull. So it's not about just having information, it's about the curation of information. Who's bringing it to you? Who can cipher it? What type of community and environment that you are in? Because growth comes from the three E's, education, exposure, and experience. See, if you can curate your education, then you can make sure that you're not just getting new knowledge, you're getting valuable knowledge that's actually applicable to your freedom and your power. You understand me? Now, the exposure is your environment because everything that you observe, you see, you feel, you hear, you become the embodiment, you vibrate at that rate. So if you're not surrounded by wealth, how can you ever vibrate, magnify, magnetize, and attract it to your reality? I was talking to my brother Idris Sandu the other day, and we were talking about the difference between manifestors and alchemists. See, some people, they can drop a thought, draw it into their universe, and build wealth and attract the right things to them. And other people, they work with what they have to be able to produce it, regardless of where they are. See, some people, you have to understand whether you're a generator or you're a manifestor and understanding your human design and your blueprint. Therefore, it gives you the right mindset. So when I say 80% mindset, 20% skill set, I mean that. But see, if you don't have the right mindset, you can't develop the right skill set. Most of you, I took courses in education and financial literacy, but when you look in your environment, you don't feel no financial liberation. We want to liberate you by helping you change the way that you think and giving you access to new education, technology, and tools that can help you enhance and give you an edge in the marketplace. You go try to try a test today in school or you can get out of high school and they tell you to take this test, you won't feel so confident. Whether it's social studies, mathematics, geography, no matter what it is. But if they tell you we'll give you the cheat codes, everybody feel like they go pass it. And see, back in the day, teaching each other and giving each other the answers, they said it was cheating, they said it was wrong. But I'm here to tell you it's no longer wrong. I want to teach you how to cheat. The reason we want to teach you how to cheat is because we want to give you the codes. We want to give you the answers because they've been hidden from you for so long that you deserve them. You deserve to have your mind right, your spirit right, your finances right. You understand me? You deserve a better life. But that can only come with better decisions, better investments, and better opportunities. In the block world order, this is what we stand for. The right community, the right education, the right technology. Through this test of life, we'll give you the cheat codes to make sure that you pass. Tapping. You know, I believe that, you know, and I spoke about this with the brother Shaka Bars, that I think black men egos, and I, I say this carefully, and they got context in the other video, so I don't have to really break it down. But when I when you go to Egypt and you see the pyramids built in our images, mm -hmm. right? Huge statues, right? You you go to Amenas, the first pharaoh, and he built his you know, his pyramids and the brothers, just the mindset that them brothers had to have was saying that, yo. Give me 50 foot statue right here, right? This gonna be, you know, the entrance to the gateway right here. Mm -hmm. But everything in their ego was also a part adding something to the collective. Mm -hmm. I think our egos are too small because it has nothing to do with building and seeing the world in our reflection, right? right? So our egos is about more so um, taking over each other and, and, and being better than the next man or woman it has nothing to do with, yo, I want a building that has my name on it just to represent that I own this world. I want this world designed in my image, right? 
we don't have our egos in that direction. They're not connected to vision. That's a good point that you think the egos are not big enough because see, we have a lot of captivity mindset. Mm -hmm. Meaning when you're in captivity, when you're in jail, the main objective is to get something off the next inmate, to, in, to overpower him and get whatever he has in many cases. We don't think, what, let's get up out of this prison and build something besides this, this incarceration mm -hmm. system. Let's yeah. build something outside of this prison. So we do need a bigger ego. Yeah, and I think that's also because when you look at uh, the hermetic um, prophecies, or yeah. what was it called, the hermetic philosophies, mm -hmm. and they were spreading that information on basically of why black people, you understand me, were not an involved people. And that all of anything that we've done in Africa was from this Semitic presence, you understand me, that worked alongside or Europeans were there to influence anything great that we did. Mm. And that they had to shrink the image and the humanity of black people consistently so that they could validate slavery. Right. So the more that they validated slavery and the larger it became, the more political it became as well. Mm -hmm. So they came up with all these systems of validation then you got the Aryan race theories and all of those things right, that started right. to come out and what we live in is we're and, and, and that played a part in how Africans started to see themselves mm -hmm. because that started to spread as people started to believe those theories mm -hmm. well long after they were proven to be a hundred percent false mm -hmm. so but now we don't see ourselves big enough Right? right? We don't see the humanity in ourselves enough, mm -hmm. right? The humanity in a black man that's from the hood, right? Or the humanity in the black woman, right? So now we have to get to this place first. We have to humanize ourselves again, right? right? And then we have to exalt ourselves. And we have to understand the code words that's been used to hide our history. Yeah. As you pointed out, we don't see ourselves in the historic record because they tell us it was something to do with Europeans. Mm -hmm. When we look at ancient comedic history, when we look at movies now, they make all of the actors white. And they've been doing that really since Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor and all of those people yeah. making the Egyptians white. And we know what they really look like. They look like black people now. Even black people who were going into Europe to help civilize European society, the Moors, they use words like Arab. When you hear the word Arab, you assume that they're talking about a pale-skinned person from the Middle East. Yeah. Um, as we know, the Moors who civilized Europe, these were jet black people. The first army came from the area that we now know as Senegal. Um, black people saved Europeans from themselves. They almost died out a couple of times in different plagues. The first plague was the Justinian plague, mm. which wiped out about 80% of the European population. They literally almost died out. It was the Moors who went in there bringing alcohol and elixirs to save them. The, the Justinian plague stopped in the year 725. The Moors were there in 711. So mm. a decade after the Moors arrived, all of the plagues went away. Mm. Look at some of the medicines that were used in Europe and used now. Look at the words, the root word, al, alcohol, alchemy. You mentioned mm. alchemy. These are Islamic words that the Moors were bringing in. Mm. When we talk about alchemy, the white supremacists, they saw black people creating scientific entities that was magic to them they didn't know what that was alchemy was a mystery to them that's why when they started coming over here trying to translate those moorish documents they were trying to turn rocks into gold and they didn't know what to do they didn't know how to process this stuff so our history is real deep yeah yeah i mean shit just in a in a gold aspect you know that was something that you, there, there, there's so many different stories and where you go into Kemet science and they show how they utilize gold, mm -hmm. right? And they believed it as to be an elixir of immortality. Mm -hmm. So they would ingest the gold in a powder form, mm -hmm. right? And they had this alchemical process where they basically use electricity to do so. And they believed the gold to be this magic molecule because mm -hmm. during that process, they would see the gold spark and they would say it would disappear for a split of a second mm -hmm. and then reemerge. And they would ingest this powder and it give them energy and electricity, right? And they believed that it was going to make them immortal and it was used as an elixir of beauty as well because mm. it helps with the micro tears of the skin because yes. gold is a superconductor of electricity. Mm -hmm. We see this when I went to South Africa and I went to Adam's Calendar, you know, it's one of the, uh, the oldest megalithic sites in the world, said to be somewhere between 80 to 200,000 years old. Mm. Now, this 
calendar was supposed to chart the stars. And these mounds where these huge stones were built is all throughout South Africa, mm -hmm. right? Well, particularly in that area. Now, most South Africans don't even know about this, mm -hmm. right? But we went up there and it was in a, in a trek of fog and I felt like a lion was gonna pop out at me, mm -hmm. I ain't gonna lie. Mm -hmm. I got these short African brothers with me, they not, they gonna get ate up quick. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I went there, man, and um, you do feel the energy. So mm -hmm. they literally measure, you understand me, the energy in that area mm -hmm. and, and it's higher there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we, we uh, grounded there, but what they was also saying is that, you know, this particular area, is, they believe that it was used for, you know, uh, mining gold. Mm. Right. Mm. But you got to ask, why would these people be mining gold that far back in time? Mm -hmm. They weren't wearing it as jewelry at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. They were using it as, you know, for tools. Mm -hmm. Right. They were using it for ingestion. They were using it in all of these different like, processes. As an energy source as well. Right. Because, right. you know, we are the fathers of medicine. We are the fathers of chemistry. We are the fathers of all these sciences. So the African curiosity has always been there way before you get these new, you know, so-called fathers of, of medicine, right? right? right. You, you got your Imhoteps, you have your Dogon people, you have us, you know, with geometry and mathematics at points in time where you would have to ask, why did they need it? Mm -hmm. Because in his story, right, it doesn't fit because mm -hmm. you telling these people that they're primitive, mm -hmm. right? They, they have no social hierarchy and they're not worth anything. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, is they spoke a language of geometry just as communication. Yeah. You understand mm -hmm. me? The sophisticated language systems, whether it's clicking or whether you utilizing the tongues in Africa has a higher vibration than mm -hmm. what we speak in English, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think about that, that even helps the formulation of our brains vibrate higher just by speaking a certain tonality better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we naturally were much further and progressed people. Even when you go into 1910s, 20s, coming out of Africa, we were more literate than anybody. Yes, Our indeed. thirst for education was higher than any people. Mm -hmm. White people were never banned from reading, mm -hmm. but their literacy rates were terrible. Yes, <laughs> so the propaganda that was spread throughout the newspapers was because they couldn't read them, mm -hmm. so they put images in there. Mm -hmm. They had to portray us as less than, because that's how they communicated to the illiterate class of white folks that these niggas ain't worth nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they had to consistently justify that. And they started elementary schools because of black people, the Freedmen schools. Mm. Those were the first public schools. And they saw how well they were doing, so they had to make those for white people. Too. Yeah. 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 And and that goes towards um, the patent offices, right? Because yeah. when we talk about foundational black Americans, our inventiveness mm -hmm. is our most powerful thing. Yes, it right? is. Now, during that time, of course, they wouldn't allow any African or slave to patent anything, mm -hmm. right? So there was a particular story of this brother, he created this, it wasn't a particular cotton gin, but it was like a cotton scraper, Yeah. right? And the white owner, he wanted to go patent it. Mm -hmm. But he told, now of course he, can't, he, he couldn't claim that he made it because he was dumb. Mm -hmm. So he said that, yo, my slave made this. And they said, well, anything made by a slave can't be patented. Mm -hmm. So he starts selling it without a patent. But what he did was key, he said that he was toting it that it was, this is an African who made this. Mm. Because what he said was that this is proof that slavery is not damaging the mind of the slave. Mm -hmm. Because some of the philosophical and moral debate during that time was that it was damaging the mind of these Africans by keeping them in slavery. Mm -hmm. But he used our own invention as a form of validating like slavery. Justification. Right, wow. <laughs> justification. Yeah. <laughs> and we have, even though we couldn't get a patent while we were enslaved, we still, black people, have over 50,000 patents. Mm -hmm. We created almost everything in the house. The yeah. modern refrigerator, the modern toilet, the modern doorknob yeah. was created by Foundation of Black American. The light bulb. When they try to say that a black person helped a white person, that means the black person did it himself. That's a fact. Um, the light bulb, um, Louis Latimer. Mm-hmm was the one who really came up with it. He yeah. was working for Thomas Edison. Thomas yeah. Edison was infamous for stealing people's That's stuff. That's a fact. Now, you work for me, anything you build, I own it. Yeah. The, a light bulb, they say, well, Louis Latimer created the filament. He. Yeah. That's the light bulb. That's what did. That's the <laughs> that's light bulb. That's the light bulb. Other than the filament, it's a piece of damn glass. Well, yeah, everything <laughs> else is just design. Right. It's a, it's a piece of glass. So he <laughs> created the light bulb. Yeah. But they have to give credit to Thomas Edison. And the reason why um, the rumor that, that Louis Latimer was able to create the light bulb, remember, we were an agrarian people. 
we work with the earth, whatever we had to do with the ground, we had to come up with ways to make it more um, in convenient for us. Black people would use cotton seeds and light it up to warm their hands. Cotton seeds are very flammable. Mm. If you look at videos on YouTube, you'll see people lighting cotton seeds. The cotton will burn and the grass won't get touched. So Lewis Latimer must have understood and watched these seeds burn for a long time. And he said, wait, what if I put this in a glass mm. and see how this works? Bam. That's how we started coming up with stuff. Mm. So, Think about how, because how genius we were, because we were engineers. Yes, we were. Engineer is the one of the studies that we go into the least now. Mm -hmm. But during our history in this country as slaves, mm -hmm. right, our engineering feat and coming out of slavery is very high. Our inventiveness was very high. Today, we're not a building and producing people. Right. But when you look at our history, we are. Yes, indeed. Right? The father of bioengineering is um, George Washington Carver. Yes, sir. He is the father of it. I want people to Google that. Google yes. the father of bioengineering. Nobody was using stuff from the earth and mm -hmm. transforming that into um, non-edible products. That's a fact. That brother was doing that first. See, they try to minimize George Washington Carver with, he just made some peanut butter. Yeah, that no, brother, hell no, no, no. That brother created a whole bunch of stuff yeah. that was used by the army, by different corporations, and it's minimized. Whatever it's we min do something. It's super minimized. Yeah. I mean, because when, it's, a, it's the same thing with Hannibal Barker. When yeah. you highlight certain aspects of history and you maximize it, you have to put his intelligence and his genius on par with how they say Einstein is. Yes, indeed. Right? Yes, indeed. Or, or, or any other their so-called great geniuses. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start giving these inventors and these engineers their just do, now you look at it and say, wait a minute, we actually have way more geniuses than you all. Mm -hmm. We actually have more inventors and more great engineers and have contributed way more. Mm -hmm. This is minuscule. This is the reason you want to highlight this as a celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, a scientist or whatever, because if you highlight everybody on the equal playing field, your contribution is minimum. Mm -hmm. You understand me at most. And the, the crazy thing about with Dr. Carver, you know, him being the master of nuts is they cut off his nuts. Yes, he did. You understand he me? Yes, he was. And, and, and just the idea of castration being a normal practice mm -hmm. back then, mm -hmm. right? Castrating a man so that he can get an education, mm -hmm. castrating a man so that he wouldn't touch one of your white women, mm -hmm. right? Like these are not things that we process yeah. when we think about America, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk reparations, we're not just talking about slavery mm -hmm. because after slavery, those are things that need to be fixed as well. Yes, indeed. The land that was stolen from the amount of black people in the South, mm -hmm. right? The amount of laws that were created to stop us from building wealth, yeah. right? The amount of systematic things that are on the books by the FBI mm -hmm. to uh, uh, overthrow, you know, organizations that was for the liberation of black people in America. Mm -hmm. These are things that are old reparations for as well. Mm -hmm. This 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 don't just end at you took off the chains in 1865, mm -hmm. right? This This is something that continues on to today to where we look at police, you know, terrorism and brutality throughout this country and say every year of the history of, you know, these, these slave catchers now known as police officers, there was some brutal act unjustly committed against black people in America. Yes. And there has to be reparations, but they know that it's an expense that they don't want to put on them books. Also, they have a problem with reparations too because when they start giving reparations, which we're going to make them give it at some point, yeah. they're going to find out the real number of black people in America. I, I think we're way more than just 12, 13%. We're highly undercounted over here. Yeah, it feels like it. Yeah. And, and, and then, and of course, you know, what they do is they, they always move the goalposts. So now what qualifies is black changes. Right. That's why now there's right. a movement of mixed. Yeah. Right. And all of these different things, because they don't want people to be locking in on that consensus, mm -hmm. because now that clock that's already running out because they don't have enough births mm -hmm. is going quicker and quicker yes, and quicker. Right. So the new consensus of Arabs being white and all these people being able to qualify. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, Hollywood is pushed behind the mechanism. Hollywood has an 100 percent agenda. Mm -hmm. There's there's no if, if you believe that Hollywood and the military industrial complex and the CIA and the government don't have a relationship, then you lost. Yes, indeed. Right. That's this is a, a, a history right of production and propaganda specifically used as a tool mm -hmm. when anything that can be used for power will be used for power yes, indeed. so when the tv come about the radio come about the power structure says okay well how can we use this because mass amounts
amounts of people are being programmed by this. Mm -hmm. They will never allow a tool that has that much control to just be in the hands of the people. It has to be centralized forms of power. But, well, that's why the, the internet was created. The internet was created, and a lot of folks don't know this, really in the 1960s to keep tabs on black militant groups. Mm -hmm. um, you from the Bay, well, you came up in the Bay. The Bay Area is a very interesting place. Yeah, because, from Oakland. Yeah, yeah from the town. There's a reason why you have so many hustlers, riders, and intellectuals yes, sir. in that area. See, that's the most important thing. You got some dudes that'll take your head off, but that, he's also a very smart dude. That's a fact. They've always had smart hustlers who were thorough, independent, and that spirit came about in the Bay Area in particular because you had a lot of the car porters in the um, Bay Area, the train porters. That mm -hmm. was a big station of train porters. And Oakland in the Bay Area, the trains would go all over the country and the Bay Area was a major stop mm -hmm. from the South, from the North, from all over the place. So black people were working as car porters. So black people would go all over the country and just get game mm. and get information and get dances and cultural things and get stock tips, get weapons information and bring that to the Bay. Mm. And they would share that information. So that's why in the Bay, a lot of dances came out of the Bay. A lot of folks don't know that. A lot oh, of yeah. the boogaloo dancing, there's a lot of Hip hop dances man, you, you came talk out of the history bay. now, man. Yeah, this is real talk. That's why so much stuff came out of the bay. So many radicals came out of the bay. So many intellectuals came yeah. out of the bay because of those carporters bringing all of that information there. Yeah, and them lineages of families is actually very strong. Like you get certain areas, and and I just came from Detroit, and you know Detroit, they they like Bay Area twins, man. They like Oakland yes, twins. Indeed. You yes, feel indeed. Me? Yeah. But when I look at that, you know Detroit, that's where the Nation of Islam was started, right? Mm -hmm in that black bottom, right? He went to the poorest of the poorest and gave them consciousness mm -hmm. and it changed the dynamic of that whole city. Mm -hmm. Then when you go look at Oakland, right? You got, of course, not only the Black Panthers, you had your Black Muslim Bakery and a multitude of other different groups that came out of that, right? And then when you go look at, you know, all of the cities right now that has the highest rates of crime and that now has the highest levels of poverty, these were once central renaissance hubs of consciousness, yes, right. right? For black liberation and empowerment and community. Mm -hmm. And all of those areas were specifically targeted because of what was being brought out. Yeah. Right. So now you see them as some of the worst places, but you have to understand that that was done to destroy those families. Yes, it was. That was done to destroy that lineage. Mm -hmm. They it couldn't handle having this 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 generation of families who have this strong intellectual prowess and this warriorship mm -hmm. and they challenge. No power. The, the, the families rule the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And imagine if left untouched, you have generations of young Black Panthers children. Mm -hmm. You understand me that, you know, are allowed to thrive and gain resources and wealth and influence. Mm -hmm. What does that look like today? Right. right. It's the right. same thing if you got that same central hub in Detroit. What does that look like today? So you have to cut off right that before because they have foresight. They always think of the future. They always want to ruin, not, I mean, not to ruin, but to own time. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they say, no, we can never allow an age mm -hmm. where we have a lineage of charismatic, intellectual, masculine, right, black men mm -hmm. that have resources and that are able to, you know, sway the people in their way, because that would be something impossible to stop. Exactly. And that's why that was the real reason they went after the Black Panthers up there, because the gun thing, they, they didn't trip on the gun thing. What they were tripping on was that free damn breakfast program. Oh, yeah. That was the real threat, because now if you can feed a people, you can lead a people, mm. and that's the foundation of nation building. That's when they started getting targeted and they had to really wipe those brothers and sisters out. And they were feeding the community. They wipe out the Black Panthers and then the U.S. government adopts the free breakfast program. Mm. That's when they said there was no free breakfast program in this country That's before the Black Panthers yeah. at all. In fact, there's so many other things that we've created. Paramedics in this country, EMTs, the first EMTs were black people in Philadelphia, in, mm. in Pittsburgh. Mm. There were no EMTs. When you got shot or somebody ran you over, the morgue would come pick you up or the police would come throw you in a paddy wagon and take you to a hospital. You didn't have EMTs working on people on the way to the hospital. There was a, a group called the Freedom House Ambulance Company that were all black people. They were trained by some, some white doctors who were trying to experiment with this thing. They were the ones doing the trial and error 
of EMT work in this country, right. and that's been buried. So we, mm. we pioneered so many things in this country as foundation. Yeah, it, it, it's really a list that is infinite because yeah. no matter, no matter you know, you go talk computer chips, you go talk yeah. street lights, you go talk all of these things, mm -hmm. and you go find our blueprint there. Always. And and now we're what we produce now. We're at this forefront, and and, and to our credit, because. When we say we don't have nothing now, it's not that we didn't do anything. Right. It's that it was stolen from us, mm -hmm. right? So I don't, this, this whole thing that black people are lazy and we don't produce none, is actually not true at all. At it's all. the most no, counter narrative ever. White people have the privilege of wealth from doing nothing mm -hmm. besides creating unfair legislation and laws that stopped us from doing it so that they can build middle classes for themselves, mm -hmm. right? And upper class and things of that nature. But there's no gift or talent or education and they're not just better financially literate or have some great work ethic. No, it's because it was literally built off the backs of our people. And what they like to do too, they like to get other non-white groups and when they come and build whatever they build, they say, well, look at this group. Yeah. They just came here from Asia somewhere. They just came here from the Caribbean or wherever, and they built something, and you guys didn't right. build nothing here. Yeah. The Arabs came over here. They were from a war-torn country, and look, they got a store. What they don't tell you is that these other groups are not targeted. That's a fact. Like us. We've always been targeted. When we get a stronghold on something and we get financial success, it's almost inevitable that we get targeted. Yeah. Um, when we have businesses like our brother Nipsey, Nipsey has a successful store, all of a sudden, a random hater shows up and gets him in broad daylight. You dig? Yeah. Who just happened to be an informant. Yeah. Going all the way back to the Black Wall Streets, these black people are millionaires building these phenomenal businesses. All of a sudden, they're dropping bombs on them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I so mean, you nobody know, nobody gets targeted like we do. And that happened to 60 plus towns after that. Yes, so indeed. our story is not told. Our story is one where we're constantly growing, we're constantly building, we're constantly developing, we're constantly working, and then we're constantly opposed. Yeah. It's not, oh, this generation ain't got nothing. It's no. This generation's family built everything mm -hmm. and everything was stolen from them. And now this generation didn't inherit none of the brilliance and none of the great things that we should have. Because we should see a billionaire family right from all of our inventors. Mm -hmm. So if you take a list of the thousand things that we invented that are common in society today, you should see a lineage of wealth directly connected to that, mm -hmm. right? But there is no patent wealth mm -hmm. because we, didn't, we weren't able to trademark and license and copyright and patent, mm -hmm. right? There's no uh, uh, extreme land wealth. Mm -hmm. We had land, but also they stole, so much land was stolen from the government because we didn't know how to set up Right, our wills and our trust and right. things of that nature. And, and to build on that, when you look at a lot of black celebrities who got a lot of money, notice how it's not really passed down to another generation. Mm. Look at some of the big superstars. Michael Jackson, who's this stuff passed down to? It's like some white kids kind of fighting over it now. That's a fact. Look at Prince. Prince stuff is in probate right now. They're still fighting over his stuff. Nobody knows who's going to get that. Look at some of these athletes out here. Who are they really passing their stuff down to? I and mean, we really just started getting large amounts of money, especially in sports and entertainment, really in the last 40 years. Mm. You understand? I think LeBron is the only candidate right to pass now. down, LeBron and Jay-Z, right. to pass down a massive amount, a lump sum of wealth mm -hmm. to a generation that will inherit it that are two black parent households. Right. You understand right. me? Which is very rare. Right. Very right. rare. Because right. if you look at the rest, there's there's none. Right. Right. Whitney Houston. We saw what happened with mm -hmm. her. She had one daughter. Daughter died. Mm. You see? Where's yeah. that money now? Yeah. You see, we see this all across the board. Oprah, no kids. Where's that money going to go? See, yeah, because you can get as much as you are not a threat. You can be a trillionaire if you don't have anybody to pass it down to. Right. This is a lifetime of wealth. It's not generational. Right. Generational wealth is where you start to see the DuPonts. Right. You start to see, you know, the the, the Waltons. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you see the J, the J.P. Morgan family. That's generational wealth that right. is passed down, inheriting industries mm -hmm. that we utilize today every single day that we don't think about. And that's the threat. See? Yes. When you get a fresh new generation that's going to start off with all of that, that's threatening because, see, with an Oprah, you can control Oprah, mm. you see? You can control an entertainer. Mm. You can threaten him with his career. But you give $100 million to some new kid, oh, I do yeah. what the hell I want to do they with this They could be thing. radical. They could be real radical, yeah. you dig? So 
Speaking of, how come a lot of people, you know, I've seen skits on HBO. I see sometimes, you know, uh, political pundits, they poke at you. They always mm -hmm. throw your name in the pot mm -hmm. and they synonymize it with uh, Hotep. But Hotep, of course, is not a bad thing in bad the first word, place. Right. But they use it as a pejorative. Right. They, right. they, they weaponize Hotep. Mm -hmm. But what is it about Tariq Nasheed, you know, um, that the mainstream, mm -hmm. right, black Americans don't like. And, and because I believe they see Tariq Nasheed, you know, as a leader, mm -hmm. right? Which uh, I always say I'm not. Right. You know? and, and you have influence, mm -hmm. but everybody, a lot of people have influence. Right. But Tariq right. Nasheed influence is directly connected to the root of consciousness in black America because you educated so many people, mm -hmm. right? So your opinion matters where you sway people. Right. Right. And that the reason they have a problem with me in particular, especially around political season like now, but even outside of political season, there's always jabs being thrown at me. The whole narrative is to kind of discredit me. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Right. Don't listen to me. The reason why is because I'm one of the few people who can talk to an intellectual audience. I've done lectures at Yale before. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can talk to an intellectual crowd but I can also get down in the streets and talk to the G's. Yes, sir. And most people can't do that. That's a fact. That's the thing, and that's a problem to them. People like Malcolm X could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few people who can do that, but that's really rare, and yeah. they don't like that. They look at you as a threat when you can talk to the intellectual crowd and they're listening to you, yeah. and you can talk to not just the grassroots, but the street dudes are yeah. listening to you because they look at the street cats as soldiers, yeah. you see? They look at them like somebody gives them a cue. They can be galvanized and they can do whatever. Yeah. So they've always looked at that as somewhat of a threat. And, and, and I can understand that, yeah. uh, especially with the way the narratives and the agendas are lined up today. Yeah, yeah. They are, they're, they're no, no longer pushing strong black men in positions of political power. Right. Right. Now, the new tool is let's find a black woman to push up in political power. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it seems great it always seems great it mm -hmm. always seems you know like okay behind this is women empowerment mm. right but what is the reality of their political consciousness right and are they for our people because it's one thing to stand in front of the people to throw about significant dates in black history mm -hmm. to gaslight us to connect with us it's another thing to get in that office and do some shit that's radical. Absolutely. And you notice when they get these black women yeah. to be in these political positions, they always make sure that that black woman has a white mate. Even if she's LGBT, hey. Lori Lightfoot out of the Chicago area, white, mm. white. Mm. Kamala Harris, white mm. zaddy. Mm. The Supreme Court lady, Katanji Brown, white zaddy. Mm. You see? That's not by accident. Yeah. They understand who you lay up with, especially as a woman. Yeah. If you're laying up with a man, you're going to take on that man's ideology. That's a fact. That's just human nature. Yeah. So they understand that these are proxies for the white supremacist male when they get these women who's laying up with these people in the dominant society. So what are they really going to do for black people? Nothing. Mm. Mm -hmm. You said a lot right there, brother. Mm -hmm. I ain't had to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but that that's a very key. And what I want people when they listen, well, number one, I want you to try to get out your feelings for a second, mm -hmm. and I want you to think critical about reality, mm -hmm. and what we're saying, mm -hmm. and why we're saying it, mm -hmm. right? And ask yourself, what is the vision you want for Black America? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we don't have, and that we need more of, is a vision. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because a vision aligns us and we can easily say, OK, you're with this and you're against us. Why do you think we have not had a vision? <sighs> I think that every time we had a vision, it's, it's been opposed by the U.S. government, specifically the FBI. Right. 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 They made it their job that any black man or woman that created a, some sort of constitution, some sort of vision mm -hmm. was killed, was defamed, right? Was put into some situation where that vision in the minds of the people was destroyed mm -hmm. because they understand how powerful it is that if you give a focused black man a vision, you understand me? You give his helpmate, a black woman, that same vision. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to stop those people from bringing that into a reality. Mm -hmm. We have such a powerful consciousness, right? The, the, the heart 
you know, vibrates more voltage of electricity, more magnifying power than the brain, mm -hmm. right? But when you get a vision, it's something that you feel. Mm -hmm. You're connected to it emotionally. Right. So right now, our vision is being steered through programming on social media, on TV, through movies, through music. It's writing the narratives of our image because they know how to weaponize our vision for them. Yes. If I can train you up and the academia of my history, uh, if I can train you up like the same way I was watching Hidden um, uh, Figures yesterday, mm -hmm. if I train, if I take the most brilliant black women that you have and I weaponize them for our propaganda and I'll fight against Russia, which matters not to the, you know, liberation of your people, but now I give them trophy. Now I'll give them position. Now they no longer see themselves as black. They see themselves in a higher class. They see themselves as rich, mm -hmm. right? They see themselves as everything else than black last. Right, right. So, what they understand is not only how to destroy a vision, but how to use the people who have a powerful ability to bring vision into reality, mm. right? Because now they may have started something, but you're going to help us finish it. Right. You understand right, me? Right. Most of when you see those, you know, memes out there, some little black kid took the Mensa test and he's smarter than Einstein. Mm. What is he going to do with that intelligence? Right. He's going to a white academia. Mm -hmm. So they, they understand the power of our collective brain trust mm -hmm. and the power of our ability to manifest things into existence at a high level. So they, they make sure that, number one, the mind of the brown man and woman stays distracted. You, you have to know what's going on in the celebrity world. You have to know all of these things that are not an asset to you. 100% of all most of information you have is a liability to you because the energy that you're using to look over here, you're distracted from what you could be building over here. And, when they, and you just made a good point. When you get a little black kid who happens to show genius tendencies, white society will get that kid and separate them. Yeah. You separate them from the herd. Yes. So we don't let you use that genius for your own people. Exactly. But we are a very magical people, man. Yeah. The magic that we have is powerful. We can literally just thread things into existence. Yeah. Our creativity, our consciousness, our dance, our expression, right? Our, our, our spiritual innovation allows us to, you know, be alchemists. We mm -hmm. still utilize that power of voodoo. Mm -hmm. We still call things into existence. Yes, but sometimes we don't know, you know, how we did it. Yeah. Right. Some yeah. of us are acting where we're just talented and we're just naturally gifted at production, at manifestation, at alchemy, at all of these things, but there's no standard to be like, yo, this is what you're tapping in because mm -hmm. now you become a master on earth. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Now you at this highest level, ain't nobody can do nothing with you. And there's a few of us that tap into that thread. Mm -hmm. And once you know they, your power, they start calling you ignorant. Mm -hmm. They start calling you cocky. Mm -hmm. They call you a narcissist. They call you everything, but they never call you unsuccessful mm -hmm. because what you're doing is working. Mm -hmm. When we look at Kanye West and we look at the propaganda that he puts out, he learned to tap into their systems. Yeah. He learned the power of propaganda, the power of design. He learned the golden ratio. He understand the mathematics of how to create things in certain proportions and how to produce success from your ideas that you have. Mm -hmm. Because they tapped into our systems when we were building pyramids, when we were building structures and temples, and when we were creating machines. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, damn, all we got to do, we ain't got to create nothing. We just need to learn they, they systems, right, and then go build our own world. And you just reminded me of something, them tapping into our systems. When I was in Haiti, and even when I go to New Orleans, you know, Mostly white people study voodoo. Mm -hmm. White people will learn voodoo before we do. That's they'll, a fact. They'll scare us. You go to some of those voodoo priests, there's white people in there trying to get the game. Oh, when I went to South Africa, I went to a bookstore out there, and <laughs> it was um, a white woman in the back. She's doing, like, readings and, like, all of this stuff, and mm -hmm. I'm looking at the books, and it's, like, all Alistair Crowley books on the wall. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. And this is, in a, this is in South Africa, mm -hmm. right? All black people, and most people don't know who Alistair Crowley is, and they can look him up, yeah. you're right, because then you start to understand you know, and he was a fraud. Yes, he was. Right? Mm -hmm. But most people utilize and think of him as higher than he really what is. But that system is something that they take serious. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That ability, that Luciferian system, that ability to turn the people backwards. Mm -hmm. Right? Because this is what they did with us. They put a spell on our, 
our entire culture. Mm -hmm. Everything that is good, that is bad, we think is good. Everything mm -hmm. is good, we think bad, right? Mm -hmm. Our whole vision is backwards, so it sends us backwards. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we, we prop people up for killing in our culture, yeah. right? If, if you kill in our culture, you become a hero. Mm -hmm. If you save somebody in our culture, you're not seen as a hero, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you captain save them. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so saviorism is not actually celebrated in our culture. Martyrism is. Yeah. Right? If you die for us, mm -hmm. then we can give you credit. Maybe you meant what you said. But if you are a leader that lives a long time, no, nah, you must be a sellout. You must be a fraud. Mm -hmm. Because you believe that this God is actually more powerful, right, than the God of good. Mm -hmm. So why would... It, 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 and most people don't even understand that this is the mindset. So we eat bad foods and we think that this is our, our best way of celebrating life. Right. Like you only get one life, so why not treat yourself terrible? Mm -hmm. This is all backwards thinking. Yeah. So Speaking of yes. backwards thinking and, 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 and Alistair Crowley, you reminded me, a lot of people talked about the rumors of him being connected with the music industry and Alistair Crowley would and, and some other higher ranking people in the music industry would put hit messages in records mm. and you play the records backwards and you would hear these messages. Yes. They would put them in Beatles records. Right. And they said that that's what uh, Charles Manson was listening to mm. when he did the health and scale the whole. Yeah. So all of that stuff ties in. Yeah, because that's that all goes to Alan Turing, right? Him creating those algorithm machines that, you know, um, helped them win the war against the Germans, right? Because they was able to decode the messages that the Germans were sending. So mm. Alan Turing was their genius, but he was also a homosexual. Mm. So they never celebrated him, oh, wow. right? But he is essentially said to be, you know, the Turing machine. And, and how to use it is the father of like algorithm and the philosophy and the, the thesis of AI, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. Mm -hmm. So they went on to use, you know, some of that same thesis when they started creating MK Ultra mm -hmm. and things of that nature, which is the CIA mind control yes. projects. Yes. And so, mo you know, when you got these projects that's being led out, you know, some were carried out in San Francisco and Oakland and different places. The Bay yes. Area has had a lot of experimental things happen up there. Yes, yeah. and they was dropping them people off. So when you see, when you see the modern product of a city, you have to say, what was the history of things that created the culmination, right? right. You don't see it in Iowa or Ohio, mm -hmm. but in certain condensed cities, there was certain experimentation that were being ran, and a lot of these patients and people were just being dropped off over there as well. Um, after the radical 1960s, we we don't know how thorough some of these militant groups were. You had black militant groups like the Black Liberation Army doing a lot of work up there in the Bay, mm -hmm. down here, all over the country. The dominant society had to figure out, we got to do something about these aggressive black men. Yeah. Okay. So in the early 70s, the streets started to get flooded with psychotropic drugs, all of this mm -hmm. acid and LSD and Sherm and all yeah. of this stuff. That's when that became real big. Mid to late 70s, crack cocaine came out of the Bay. Mm. Um, Tootie, um, Tootie Reese. Tootie Reese was a drug dealer out here. He got the formula from, from crack and yeah. brought it down here. That's how it got popping because they were experimenting with making it up there. It's real heavy stuff. So yeah. they were deliberately putting this stuff in the streets at a very specific time for a very specific purpose. At the height of consciousness, specifically yeah. political consciousness as well. Yeah. If, if you see a people being militarized, they become political, they become nationalized, mm -hmm. now they're a threat, now they're a problem. Yes. Because now you can see the future. Mm -hmm. I see where these people are headed, and I don't like it because they're getting more organized. Yeah. So how do you fractionalize the people? You put them on drugs that detaches them from reality, mm -hmm. right? Now they have no linear thinking, mm -hmm. right? Now they can't make decisions. So they never go tap into that mind of God again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, when uh, you have a faction of the government who does uh, um, programs to, to literally see if they can create psychics and mind control and create these assassins with keywords and mm -hmm. they're, they're utilizing, um, you know, frequencies and all of these different things. Like they was trying to see if they can make a person attracted to the same sex during those times. Yep. These yep. are, this is not mm -hmm. uh, opinionated based things. This is stuff you can go study that is historical record. Mm -hmm. And during that time, it was printed in the newspaper, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this was stuff that you could imagine if that's printed in the newspaper today that CIA says that they run in a mind control program, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it probably would get dismissed because we so used to things now, but during that time, 
people were in uproar yeah. about certain things. Mm -hmm. Th that was the difference is people actually were in uproar about things that the government did. Now we We've accept everything. Exactly. And, and now they, they've it normalized really it so much. They'll just not, put it in the music industry. Now they'll, they'll just have people, instead of giving you a mind control or using some kind of propaganda, they'll get people to rap the shit now. Yeah. So if you look at music now, they promote heavy drug use now. And smoke weed, smoke weed, do mollies, do mollies, do all. And when we have people high and whacked out of their mind, they're not going to fight white supremacy. Oh, no. Yeah. They fight demons that yeah. don't even exist. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crack, heroin, PCP, right? Um, ketamine, ADHD, where people utilize uh, Adderall. Man, there's all kind of drugs out there that people utilize. Um, liquor, you know, weed. People are addicted to so many different things, right? And the average person that wants to quit, they can't. They don't have control over their own will, right? Which means they don't have control over their own way and their own destiny and they're enslaved to the things that they take. Now, how do you gain control over self? Of course, there's a mental function, but there's also a biological function as well. See, oftentimes when we're addicted to something, we crave it. There's a excitement, and that excitement is, if you will, an electrical spike, right, in our brains. We automatically think that if I get that, I'll be rewarded with the pleasures. So your brain is operated based on what it feels, not what it thinks. You understand me? The moment you think of that drug, it is inducing a small chemical in the brain to make you feel that same pleasure that you will if your will continues to go towards manufacturing and producing and manifesting that drug into your reality. Putting you in this cycle, want and will, desire and action consistently. How do you disrupt that? Well, if I want something, but I have a stronger will than the things that I desire, and I can disrupt that, and biologically I also have the capabilities within because my body doesn't crave something because it no longer needs it. Meaning that it's already at an electrical spike of activity, right? You're already high off energy. So therefore you say, nah, I don't need the drink. Nah, I don't need the coffee. My willpower is stronger. See, in the 19th century in the UK, they utilize gold as a way to curb addiction, right? Now, this was a necessary process, and they still utilize gold today in cancer treatments and tumor treatments and all sort of different ways that they utilize gold. The ancient people knew the recipe. They knew how to utilize the elements of the world to take control and power over self. Imagine if you had the greatest electrified operating system in the world and you can begin to control your own will. We've had great testimonials from people who are addicted to weed, people who are addicted to liquor, people who are addicted to coffee, and they've all been able to start to begin to take control of their own will and curb these addictions. And they believe that the assistance of the gold allowed them to be able to tap into that higher mode instead of being controlled by their lower selves. Now they're so electrified, it's their higher mind that is in hyperdrive. Make sure y'all tap in, get on the gold, stop being controlled by your addictions and your afflictions. Instead, make gold a part of your new ritual. Tap in. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I want to jump a little bit back into um, history with like Mansa Musa, yeah. right? Yeah. Mansa Musa, everybody knows him being, you know, um, a, a Muslim wealthy, mm -hmm. you know, black king. Um, who conquered empires and he had wealth that, you know, was so vast when he brought it in, you know, he killed those systems of currency because yeah. it was so much uh, wealth and gold that he brought with him. Mm -hmm. But also there's there's legends to say that, you know, he crossed over into, you know, modern Mexico and what was known as Montezuma. Right. right? Have you heard those stories? I've heard that too. I heard yes, that sir. too. Um, when they sent Abu Bakari, when they came over here with all of those ships, they said that they landed over there in the Mexico area. And when you look at the Mexico area, you look at some of the murals, the bone and pack murals. You got jet black people with dreadlocks. Um, you got the Olmec statues that's been there for thousands of years, from what I understand. And these yeah. are clearly black people, and yeah, they sorry. act like these statues don't exist down there. Yeah, I mean, when I went to when I went to Egypt, and you can clearly see the black faces on the walls. Mm -hmm. There's no argument there. Right. 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 Only right. A, you have to be a crazy person to then to go look at the evidence and then conclude that these were white people. Exactly. This, uh, <laughs> but going to Mansa Musa, Mansa Musa was a gift and a curse. Mansa Musa had a lot of money, was the richest man in recorded history, had all that gold. Um, they took a trip over to Mecca for the they did their pilgrimage. He had so much gold that he was giving out. It depressed the economy of mm -hmm. Egypt. 
that was a good thing. He was known as a very generous person. The bad thing was he was flossing too hard. Mm. And when you floss too hard, that makes you lunch. All these Europeans started to see all of that wealth that he had, and Africa became a lunchbox. Mm. They said, we got to get our weight up and get over there and get all that. Yeah. Right after he did that, Africa became a target. Mm. So right in the 1400s, they had their eyes on Africa. Henry the Navigator, they, we got to go get that. We over yeah. here starving, and these niggas running around here with all this gold. Yeah. We getting that. So yeah. they started to tool up, and they, that's when they started exploiting Africa. Mm. So that was a gift and a curse. Sometimes... You can be generous, but don't floss. He was flossing a little bit. Yeah. And that's been our problem. See, I like to look at our history and see where we went right. Right. Where did we go wrong? Flossing. We got to yeah. hold back the flossing. White people know not to floss. Mm -hmm. White people, they'll be sitting up here in a dirty T-shirt and some dirty shoes, and that will be a billionaire. That's you don't even know it. That's a you fact. Know? So they learn. They know. Yeah. We ain't trying to show you everything we got. Yeah. The minute we get something, we got to go buy a big watch and a big chain and a big old car to yeah. let everybody know that that's we got it. That's a fact. The white boy would do the exact opposite. I've been in rooms with billionaires, and it looks like a homeless shelter. You yeah. don't even know who's who or who's doing what, but they... Do not floss. They know better. Yeah, that's a lesson, man. We could have yeah. learned. Uh, uh, what's, what was his name? Frank White? Frank Lucas? Frank, Frank Lucas. Lucas, yeah. Yeah, man. If somebody would have told him about Masa Musa, man, he yeah. might have learned the lesson early. <laughs> wearing that fur coat to that fight. Also, you know, trying to be in the spotlight. Yeah. Um, going back to the drug dealers, Nicky Barnes. When Nicky Barnes got on the cover of the New Yorker magazine, that was the, the beginning of the end for that whole click out there. Yeah. He was a drug dealer. For those who don't know, Nicky Barnes was a Harlem drug dealer. Um, everybody knew he was a drug dealer and somebody asked him to be on a magazine cover and he did it to floss and when he did that all them RICO charges everything started coming down on him so so also th th there's something else you know I remember when you was on your way to the UK yeah and there's a band on you yeah, yeah. right so it's, 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 it's two things I want to get into right mm -hmm. there because now that you know the Queen has met her demise mm -hmm. A, lo a lot of people have a hard time reconciling the history of the royal family and the things that they did, right, towards colonism, uh, colonialism, and them as colonizers, mm -hmm. right, and determining what was their history as mm -hmm. far as the ugly history of the royal family, mm -hmm. right, and then how they separate the queen as being so-called innocent yeah. from that history, mm -hmm. even though she's been the longest proclaimed reigning, right, a, a, a royal leader in the world. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, number one, how did you get banned from the UK, man? Um, how you get banned from a whole country? The only whole person country. I know was the first Minister Farrakhan. Minister, yep. And now you. Yeah, we, um, we were doing Hidden Colors 5, and we mm. were screening them all over the country, and me and my lady were about to hop on a plane, and right when we got on the plane, American Airlines came with a note. They were like, um, Mr. Nancy, you can't go to the UK. I'm like, really, why, why is that? Well, you're banned, and if we take you over there, the airline is gonna be sued. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, you can't go to the UK. So I had to get on the phone, call them. I'm like, what, the, why am I banned? And they would say, well, your presence is not conducive to the safety of Britain. What does that mean? That's a real vague. Answer. Yeah. So basically, they just me influencing people there. They thought that was a threat. Mm. And um, I, we sent Brother Kaba out there to do the screening. Mm. Because, you know, I could get out there. But they told me if I, I if I have a layover in Britain, they're going to detain me. Wow. And I'm not a part of the organization. I'm, I don't have any felonies anymore. And I don't have any criminal cases. Just a person who talks about white supremacy. That's a threat. That that has that's, that says a lot about when we talk about power systems and structures mm -hmm. and the people that surveillance it and mm -hmm. watch it and how they determine. Because you got to imagine these are real people in rooms making decisions. Yeah. And they determine after watching your presentation of hidden colors, mm -hmm. looking at your profile, they had to come up to some conclusion that this influence will have great impact on the citizens, specifically black citizens. Yes, right. Indeed. So they made a determination that this is dangerous for us. Yep. And a lot of people don't think that there's real agendas and people in small rooms making these decisions as far as how the mass population should be influenced. Exactly. But you being banned from the UK, mm -hmm. right, is direct proof of that. Yes, indeed. Because yes, you indeed. didn't do any violence to anybody. You didn't commit any crimes. Exactly. You specifically told the truth, right, mm -hmm. in, in the history and delivered that education to our people. And they right. said that that's a threat. Exactly. 
And knowing the, the history of the royal family, again, going back to them, they try to play innocent. These are evil people. Mm -hmm. These people have been committing atrocities for the longest, and not just on the general public and the non-white people. They do it to themselves. Mm. Look at Princess Diana. Mm. People need really, really need to get into what went down with her mm. when she was with Dodi Fayed, who's a non-white person, it was a Muslim. And remember, the British family and those royals in Europe, they don't want another situation where they have Moorish bloodlines popping through. That was the problem mm. that, that made Europe fall in the first place. The Moors running everything. So they said, we're not going to have another Moorish situation where this woman is going to have a potentially African baby who's going to have claim to any part of the crown. So there's a reason why that woman was offed over there in Paris. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't the paparazzi. That woman wasn't, they weren't running for their lives from some damn people trying to take a picture. You know, that don't make sense. Yeah. Dodi Fayed's dad even said that, hey, they were killed by the military, the, the British mm. military. They've said that. Now look at Meghan Markle now. They've somewhat excommunicated them because they have these mulatto children now. Mm -hmm. They don't play about the bloodlines at all, mm -hmm. man. That's an Aryan white family right all there. All day. All day. And yeah. they're German. You know that family's German. Yeah. You know? And see, it's... I'm a very logical man. Yeah. If, if I have a superpower, it is logic, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I look at a family that calls themselves a royal family, mm -hmm. which means that they believe that they're supreme, mm -hmm. right? So this is a white supremacist family by the logic and definition of what they represent, mm -hmm. a bloodline, yes. right? This is what they consider to have a supreme or a royal bloodline, mm -hmm. right? These are not people that are interested in mixing with African, right, blood. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, you can't denote any other conclusion. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the history of the family and their cycles of how they colonized and they stole and they robbed and they killed and they raped and they maimed. There's no other conclusion that you can come from besides that the royal family is a representation of white supremacy in its truest form. Oh, they, at they, the highest form. Mm -hmm. They colonized, what, 90% of the damn planet. Half the well, over half the planet was colonized by this one royal family. They yeah. received all the benefits, and they act like there's some type some type of symbolic power. No, they run the show. Yeah. Why yeah, do they, you think Why you think so many Africans love when they was crying and yeah. sobbing? And did you feel anything? I mean, man, no, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> the, and that just shows how colonized some of you know the non-white people are for them yeah. to sit up there crying over that woman, and that woman has rape the resources of their homelands. Yes. You dig? Yeah. That shows how deep white supremacy is psychologically. Yeah. So where are we at right now in, in history and time, man? We, we, we had an interesting parallel where we have more information, mm -hmm. more resources, more access, more ability to communicate mm -hmm. at any other point in time in the history of this planet Earth. Mm -hmm. What do you believe is that thing that stops us, right, from you know, besides reparations and, and having that particular resource repaired, but what is that thing that you believe that stop us from committing to that next level of our progress? That's a great question. You know what the problem is, brother? We could get rid of systematic white supremacy mm. if we really, really wanted to. Mm. Because let me show you something, man. The brothers and sisters down in Florida, the Maroons, when they were a small number, there's only a few hundred of them yeah. beating the U.S. Army mm. over in Haiti. Those were unarmed people. These were slaves who didn't yeah. have no weapons. Yeah. Beating three armies. When we decide to say, hey, enough is enough. Enough will be enough. Yes, sir. A lot of times we don't want the responsibility mm. of running things on our own because we think, a lot of us think we kind of got it made. We mm. can just kind of laugh, joke, dance. Let white people take care of the, the heavy lifting. We yeah. think we got a little good, a good deal going on right yeah. now. But we also understand if we get the white supremacists out of here, Who's going to run the waterwork system? See, mm. now we can't be clubbing mm. and lollygagging. We got to get up at six in the morning. So we want managers. Right, right. See, we want, we think those are cool little managers. They do that. And we can do our little lollygagging and jerking around. We got to get down to serious business because look, the white supremacists are going to die off, unfortunately, because their numbers are dwindling, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, you know, I, I see, I, I give, I give like raw racism yeah. 20, 30 years. Yeah, it, it's not going to be around. Gonna be I, I tell black people yeah. this. They're not going to be running stuff too much longer. Just by nature. Yeah. Okay, nature is going to, you know, 
handle that, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it. We're going to have to start running stuff and getting into the habit mm. of who's going to run them satellites up in the right. sky. Who's going to run the power grids? Who's going to do the non-pretty work? Mm. You see? So you said we, right at this point, we're dependent. Yeah. How yeah. You, like, and, and, and then, of course, we're talking about races. I can't say of everybody who's who's handling whatever engineering responsibilities are racist. But, yeah. you know, I, I can say that, you know, the idea of separation and breaking off completely means that you have to restart. Yes, right? you do. And then you From have scratch. to have the knowledge yeah. in the community of people that's restarting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can only build to, you know, the intellectual and the educational level mm -hmm. and the ability of those people. Mm -hmm. Right. So. But, uh, you know, and that's why it's dangerous that when we go get educations and we go to HBCUs, and I've seen a recent article that said that now there's a higher percentage of white students that's coming into these HBCUs, yeah. right, um, that's taking over. So the one thing that we talked about when we took college is that it is a great experience. Mm. So I tell people, yo, college is scamming. You ain't getting, it's not worth it now. Mm. But they say, what about the experience? Well, now the experience is becoming gentrified so you won't even be able to get that experience because white people are looking for it as well. But when, when they come, they integrate and they gentrify the experience and it waters down. So now you won't be able to get that HBCU experience in the next 10, 20 years. Right. Right. So right. now you really have to see college for what it is. And it's a way of creating a certain class of workers. You dig? But at the same time, it's a scam for them to be able to get money. Yeah. And, yeah. and we can tell that because of the amount of debt right, versus the people that actually got educated and that have a skill set that they applied and that was as valuable as that did. Mm -hmm. See, when, when we first started having the HBCUs, you know, they were A&E and uh, like agriculture and engineering, so there were already jobs ready. So we were going to go and get a very specific job. Now we don't have that. We have communications. We, we have all of these useless um, <laughs> yeah. degrees now and yeah. you get out and where are you going to apply this stuff now? Mm. And I'm not trying to knock anybody from going to college, but we have to focus more on trades mm -hmm. and be very specific about what we're going to go to college for. What are we going to do specifically? Not just go to get in debt because yes. that's what's happening now. Yeah. You're getting out of college and you're driving for Postmates in debt when that's you get fact. out of college. That's not it right there. We got to be more focused about what we need to do. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we're going through, you know, um, uh, economic restart over the whole world. Mm -hmm. New systems are being laid out. Mm -hmm. By the time this thing finishes and we go through whatever this cycle is that we're going through, the same players that was at the top won't be there. A lot mm -hmm. of them are going to be ate up by those who have the ability to buy those companies, expand, right? And then there's going to be new businesses that's going to be built out because you have the millennial and the Gen Z. Their needs and their wants are different. Mm -hmm. You look at the Asian population, they're saying that less people are spending. Where there was the, 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 the Asian spenders, right, were making up for increasing the, the, the economic size over there in China. Mm -hmm. But now they got what they call these super savers, mm -hmm. right? So now they believe in figuring out ways to be as frugal as possible, yeah. right? They don't want to spend a dollar because we've been through these economic cycles that aren't fun to go through, the recessions yeah. and the COVID. So now people are scared to spend a dollar, yeah. right? Yeah. So everybody has to go through this transition where you have to pivot. You have to change your business models based on the new psychology of society. Right. So when I look right. at education, you can't have the same education in the world has changed. Changed mm -hmm. 10 times, mm -hmm. right? But the same education is there. Right. So now it's more important than the kid know how to monetize YouTube mm -hmm. than it is for them to get African American studies economically. Right. Right. right? right, right. So how do you, you know, uh, um, justify education and the increased tuition where the education is the same and the world changes, which decreases the value of that education? Um, this is why we have to learn how to evolve with the culture. It's very important to understand the culture and how to evolve in the culture. Um, just like, like when I do the movies. When I started doing movies 10 years ago, DVDs were the lick. Mm -hmm. So now DVDs are going out now. So now I had to learn how to get streaming sites. We're working on the streaming site now. So you've got to evolve. You've got to adapt, man. Production uh, right yeah. now. Like when we do high-level conversation, the key about it is, you know, 
everything when, when you I don't just try to throw the same template over every video every video needs something different yeah right we may have long streams of conversation so we need more b-roll mm -hmm. because a person may not just want to look at somebody talk for 10 minutes straight mm -hmm. but if there's b-roll it resets attention yes, it does. so but when in our culture things about design and production are more important than ever because the way we're communicating now in a way that we're monetizing our intellectual property has changed mm -hmm. everybody has to have a media arm in their business yeah Yes. Right. Yes. Now you get to be a political pundit that doesn't have to run for office. Right. Right. But right. you have the same influence and sway over somebody that is a governor, that somebody that is an alderman or, you know, even we've seen Donald Trump become president through social media. Yes. So now right. the way you strategize and the way you attack your own you know, business model has to change. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I teach blockchain specifically because I feel like Number one, the ideas of cryptocurrency wasn't about buying low, selling high. It was more so about this allows us to create a whole new decentralized system. Right. If there was ever, and I can't tell you who made it, I can't tell you if there's a nefarious agenda behind it, but if there was ever a technology that we was waiting on, it's the blockchain. Every generation there exists tools to change the lives of those at the bottom class and at the top. These tools are Things like the internet, or the printing press, or the light bulb. It represents innovation, paradigm shifts for generations to come. Those who have the education are able to take full advantage of the innovation by setting themselves up as the industry leaders, the most qualified and skilled, so where they can teach the world what's to come because they are the ones that build it. It's starting to feel like even though we have access to all this information, most people still don't know how to use it. It's like the world is getting tested, but you need a cheat code in order to make sure that you pass it. People feel like the algorithm is against us. Well, what if I told you that we built the algorithm that was for you? In the block world order, it's about technology, it's about community, and it's about education. And giving you the opportunity to free yourself to make sure that you're not waiting on the next generation and the next tool and the next technology and the next update to be free. You come on this journey and this ride with us, we'll make sure that you grow with us, you build with us in a manner to where you won't be left behind. There's perfection, and then there's greatness. Perfection is the state you reach, but it can never be consistent because the moment that you move is no longer in that same perfect state. Your goal is to reach greatness, but I want greatness to be normalized. I don't want it to be something that only this 1% have access to. This new 1% that runs parallel to it are those who understand how to innately tap into their gifts. See, I look at the way that the world has been created and the way that the world is consistently being ran. When you have monarchies, they can just tell you that their bloodline is more real than everybody else. They create rules, they create seals, they put it on paper, and the rest of the world starts to follow that forever. Now that's power. It's not perfect, but it's great. But it's great. Now we got new systems, blockchain. These systems sit there to challenge the existing system where new seals, new families, new records, new history can be created. But what does that matter if you're not educated and you're consistently distracted? They said because of social media, this new technology, it has actually made people more distracted and less focused. So therefore, they say the average person can only focus somewhere around seven to 10 seconds. Seven to 10 seconds. <laughs> now for me, I think that's terrible. The reason I think it's terrible because we have access to more information than any other people at any other point in time. Yet, we don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's value, and what's bull. So it's not about just having information, it's about the curation of information. Who's bringing it to you? Who can cipher it? What type of community and environment that you are in? Because growth comes from the three E's, education, exposure, and experience. See, if you can curate your education, then you can make sure that you're not just getting new knowledge, you're getting valuable knowledge that's actually applicable to your freedom and your power. You understand me? Now, the exposure is your environment because everything that you observe, you see, you feel, you hear, you become the embodiment, you vibrate at that rate. So if you're not surrounded by wealth, how can you ever vibrate, magnify, magnetize, and attract it to your reality? I was talking to my brother Idris Sandu the other day, and we were talking about the difference between manifestors and alchemists. 
See, some people, they can drop a thought, draw it into their universe and build wealth and attract the right things to them. And other people, they work with what they have to be able to produce it, regardless of where they are. See, some people, you have to understand whether you're a generator or you're a manifester and understanding your human design and your blueprint. Therefore, it gives you the right mindset. So when I say 80% mindset, 20% skill set, I mean that. But see, if you don't have the right mindset, you can't develop the right skill set. Most of you, I took courses in education and financial literacy, but when you look in your environment, you don't feel no financial liberation. We want to liberate you by helping you change the way that you think and giving you access to new education, technology, and tools that can help you enhance and give you an edge in the marketplace. You go try to try a test today in school or you can get out of high school and they tell you to take this test, you won't feel so confident. Whether it's social studies, mathematics, geography, no matter what it is. But if they tell you we'll give you the cheat codes, everybody feel like they go pass it. And see, back in the day, teaching each other and giving each other the answers, they said it was cheating, they said it was wrong. But I'm here to tell you it's no longer wrong. I want to teach you how to cheat. The reason we want to teach you how to cheat because we want to give you the codes. We want to give you the answers because they've been hidden from you for so long that you deserve it. You deserve to have your mind right, your spirit right, your finances right. You understand me? You deserve a better life. But that can only come with better decisions, better investments, and better opportunities. In the block world order, this is what we stand for. The right community, the right education, the right, education, the right technology. Through this test of life, we'll give you the cheat codes to make sure that you pass. Tap in. The first was the internet, right? right? Because, right. you know, it democratized access to media and commerce and things of that nature right? and influence. And now it's the blockchain where it democratizes access to financial systems, mm -hmm. right? Ownership, copyright, trademark, yeah. patent systems. Mm -hmm. So now I talk to my brother Idris Sandu and we talk about this is the place where we can actually write our history and our narrative. Mm -hmm. And it can't be destroyed mm -hmm. because of the very nature of this technology. So being able to understand and recognize what well, you grab a historian like yourself and a filmmaker like yourself, and I talked about like creating, you know, a, a metaverse museums or depicting history in the way that we tell it, mm -hmm. right, and showing what that looks like. Right, right. Part of not having a vision is your imagination never being fed, mm -hmm. right? Our imagination is fed from white writers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We get black producers and actors, mm -hmm. but we don't write the scripts. Right. The scripts is where all the spelling and the magic is. Mm -hmm. This is where people take scripts and movies as true history. They're not, most people are, are given the benefit that Woman King is a true story right. and that this is accurate depiction. The white woman wrote that script. Yes, mm -hmm. and the slavers are held as heroes. Right. So right. most people are like, yo, we got to see that. We got to show our young girls. What mm -hmm. are you showing them? Mm -hmm. You're showing them a depiction of once oppressors that sold out black people in America mm -hmm. and holding them up as a way for a young girl to get inspired and gain some confidence because she see a black woman on the screen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a trick bag. It really is. You understand yeah. me? And they play us like that, mm -hmm. but our responsibility is to say, okay, we get it, Tariq Nashi, mm -hmm. we get it 19 keys, mm -hmm. but what we go build, right. right? And this is why I love what you've done because you've built a legacy, mm -hmm. right? And you've built media and film that fosters and feeds the imagination and the vision of our people to where it'd be like, yo, I can now see myself. And I, and I created a whole media apparatus to counter those narratives. Mm -hmm. When I first started doing the Hidden Color series, the reason I did it was because you had movies at the time that were horrible to us spiritually. Remember around 2008, 2009, around that whole period, you had movies like The Help, which was horrible for our psyche to see mm -hmm. black women moping around yeah. under these white people. You had movies like The Blind Side. Mm. You had movies like The Butler. <laughs> All of these movies, man, had us in these real weird subservient positions. 12 Years a Slave, mm -hmm. where there had to be a white hero saving us. So psychologically, that was draining us. So I had to create something. I was waiting on somebody to create something, but nobody would do it. We kept saying, we need an alternative. So I said, okay, let me do something. Let me get all the people that I like, the people that I've read and studied, and let me try something new. There was nothing done like Hidden Colors before. Mm -hmm. uh, a movie talking about 
straight up and down hidden black history while we're attacking white supremacy. That was mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. Because that's the, the kicker, because yeah. most people get funding from the dominant society. So you're not going to say too much about the dominant society. That's a fact. At the same time we were getting the stuff together for the Hidden Colors film, Kickstarter was something that was brand new. It was a crowdfunding site. Yes. See, us adapting to technology. Right. That was new. Crowdfunding was very new. And I jumped on that early. So I said to my, my Twitter followers and people, I said, they got something called Kickstarter. Well, we can fund projects that we like. If you guys can put 20,000 on here, I'll do the rest. We got 20,000 in a month. Then we did the movie. It took off. The whole series became history. Mm. So we did something that was based on a need. Yeah. Yeah. How much, how much you think that if a person today want to create their own documentary, what would you, how much you say in a budget should they have? I would say to do a real thorough one, just starting off, um, at least 50 to a hundred thousand dollars okay. to make it thorough, to make it real yeah. comparative to what's on the screen now. Mm -hmm. um, I've upped the budgets on some of my other films. Like one of my most expensive films was 1804. Yeah. Um, because we had a lot of extras in it. We had a lot of people, we, we were doing army and war scenes yeah. and we were using genuine costumes and we were flying all over the world to film. We filmed in um, um, Europe. That's when I can go to Europe at the time, well, the UK. We filmed a lot in Haiti. We filmed out here. So we did a lot of reenactment scenes. And um, I try to make my films comparative to what's in Hollywood right yeah. now. Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. Like, I, I really want to get into more creating docu-series. Yes. You understand me? Yes. Picking these particular topics and diving deep into them and telling these stories in, in, in ways that we just never seen before. Yes, indeed. Right? And the way you tell the story and the aesthetics of it is important. Mm -hmm. When I see the conscious community or even our historians, oftentimes it was never in, it's never any great production. Right. 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 So the knowledge is high, mm -hmm. but the aesthetics is low. Right. And that's important because you go watch something ignorant mm -hmm. where the production it's is high, high, but the mm -hmm. content is ignorant, mm -hmm. but I can sit there and enjoy this easier because it's smoother, it's a flow. And the stuff you see on screen, no matter how ignorant it is, it's more influential That's because a fact. it's a clearer picture in the mind. Yeah. It's brighter, it's bigger, so that hits you different. That's a fact. So it's more of a reality thing. So, like, yeah. propaganda is key, and I want yes, to end is. on this point. Yeah. One of the things that I always talk about, right, is, like, um, creating this propaganda campaign. Mm -hmm. The campaign is essentially, let's say, you know, we take the blackest cities in America, mm -hmm. and across the billboards you see you know, the black dollar is now circulating $20 in the black community. Mm -hmm. Black families on the rise, right? Um, it says that, you know, black men um, are going to uh, become, I don't know, business owners at a higher rate than they will go to jail, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is you start to put out all of these positive statistics that are counter to the narrative of what exists, that exists today. Mm -hmm. So you start to build up this vision in the head of the people. And one thing I know about vision is that once a person sees something, there's a feeling attached to it. Mm -hmm. The feeling communicates your drive, your will. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you see a hamburger, I'm hungry, I gotta go eat, right? right? Because now I just experienced eating it in my head. Man, that's gonna taste good, can't wait to taste it. Mm -hmm. I gotta go experience this feeling. Mm -hmm. So we experience everything twice. Yeah. The vision allows us to experience a new reality for us. Mm -hmm. So if there's a campaign that when you walk outside and you see in positive programming, mm -hmm. right, now you are being programmed to create that reality. Because yeah. you feel good about it. Oh, we eating healthier? Wait, mm -hmm. you said diabetes down by 50%? That's mm -hmm. what's up. You're not about to then go eat, right, counter to the narrative that you see existing. You want to contribute that to it. They mm -hmm. said a black dollar is circulating 20%. I mean, uh, 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 20 days. I thought we was like six hours or something like that at first. Man, I'm about to go spend black, shoot. Right, I want to be right. a part of that change right, right so instead and, and this is why I'm, I'm heavy on rappers because they always talk about what well, we create what we see sometimes you have to create what you want to see right right it's, it's one thing to be reflective it's another thing to be aspirational like the early rap records yeah they didn't have no money mm -hmm. like sugar hill gang i got a stereo mansion cars they would talk about all this stuff and then that manifest itself into yeah. the music later yeah so yeah yeah that's a that's key true. That's true. and so you know um you also have the Black Museum, yeah, right? Yeah. And this is so important because 
when we talk about even the royal family and all the things that they've stole, we talk about all these things. We, we creating the museums also, I believe, gives us a place to where when we lobby and tell these people, give us our shit back, we have a place to put it. Yes, indeed. You understand yes. me? Yes. Um, yes. I think it was Blue Pill that said conservatorship. Mm. Right. So being able to have conservatorship over our history, our artifacts, our assets, we want them out of your museums and we want them in our museums. Yes, right. And therefore, when we come and we can tell our story, if they belong to us, put them where a place where we say we own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a beautiful future that I see. Mm -hmm. Because I can't go, you know, one museum, that's cool, mm -hmm. right? And, and, but we need thousands of yes, them. Yes, we do. We have so much history that we couldn't fill up our history in no museum. We need, million, we need so many to fill up and tell a real true story of who we are, right? Last time I was up in the Bay, brother, I saw about 10 Asian museums. Yeah. In the Bay. Yeah, they got a lot. All Asian art, place. Asian history, Asian dance, Asian fashion. Mm -hmm. They have so many places that hold who they are, they can see themselves reflected. Yes, indeed. If they want to learn about themselves, they can walk down the street. If we want to learn about ourselves, where do we go? Right. We have to wait till maybe they have having a special mm -hmm. and they have a Dr. Martin Luther King special and they're showing his civil rights history. Right. There and, should be permanent and, residency everywhere. And out here, man, what's unfortunate. Our tourist attractions, if you want to go to the black neighborhood to a tourist attraction, you know what the biggest tourist attraction is in L.A.? Mm. Nipsey Hussle's death site, where our brother got shot and killed. That's our backwards culture. You, you, you see? That's a tourist attraction in the neighborhood. That's one yeah. of the reasons why I wanted a museum. We, we have to have something more constructive, and, you know, God rest my brother. But we have to have something constructive for people who are going to come down to visit yes, the sir. neighborhood. Let me ask you one last question. This is a different. Yeah. Because, you know, your early days, mm -hmm. You were a Mac, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Spitting game. Spitting yeah. game. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 the way I'm I'm, I'm I'm framing it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, know, you 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 have the ability to communicate today. Yeah, men don't have that ability to communicate anymore. Yeah. There's these things called incels. You heard of that term? Yeah, I heard that term. Involuntary uh, celibate. Yeah, 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 something like that with involuntary versions, virgins or something like that. Something so, like that. so from what I hear now, you know, but <laughs> because of their status as incels, and of course you got Manosphere and Red Pill, and, yeah. and what I see is the, 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 the theme along it is y'all don't know how to communicate with women. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You don't know how to project your value and your confidence. Mm -hmm. Now I come from Oakland. Yeah. When I say that, you understand that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, yeah. Oakland is the home of great communication. Yes, indeed. Right? But, you know, a lot of people don't have that ability today, and it's a lost art to young men. So what would be your advice to the, the millennials and the Gen Z when it comes to you know, being a man and being able to communicate to women confidently. The reason why they can't communicate, Brother Keys, is because the internet has enabled a lot of nonverbal communication. Mm. See, I came up in a game, was no internet. Yeah. In the, the 90s, yeah. you had to go out physically, meet the ladies, yeah. chop it up with them. They had to feel your vibe, That's a fact. To feel your energy. Right now, LOL. You can type your emotions now, shaking my head. Yeah. I feel good. You yeah. look good. So there's no emotion and there's no game in there. Mm, no it's connection. All, yeah, it's no real connection. Yeah. 90% of communication is nonverbal. Uh huh. So online, everything is verbal. You're just saying stuff, but it's not being conveyed the right way. Yeah. That's not a substitute for game. Game is the vibe that you give to each other. You and the woman, whoever you're chopping up game to, it's the vibe, and that's what the, the whole thing is about, the connection. And that's how you learn what to say, what not mm. to say, how to act around a person and not act around a person by yeah. being physically there. Yeah. Now, the game is very transactional now. Mm. Relationships are extremely transactional. Girls now, you meet them online, like, here's my OnlyFans. Yeah. So you're not even getting to see or right. be around her sexually in a physical right. manner. You got to look at it online. You got to buy something. You got to buy something. It's an entry right. fee. Right. Yeah, women have turned themselves into products. Yeah. And men turn themselves into simps. Exactly. You so know what the, I'm saying? That, that energy ain't there no more. Yeah. So it, got, you got to get off that internet. Okay. You can't be on the internet all day. Yeah. You got to get offline and really get out here and meet people physically and interact with people physically. That's why it's important to go to things like the Revolt Summit and other mm -hmm. events where people are networking with each other in person. I you agree know? with that. I yeah. agree with that 100%. I think that the, the, the very qualities that can turn a young male to those rites of passage, mm -hmm. right? Like for me, my older brother, 
I had him, he had, like, brother was masterful when it come to gang. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. So, but when I was young, early, he, he had forced me to go out there and talk to women. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He said, look, man, you go talk to her, I'm going to beat your ass. Yeah. So I'm like, shit, I'd I yeah. rather her say no than yeah. fight you. Right, right. But I learned my confidence from that because what I realized, you know, of course, she, she going to say yes. Mm -hmm. So all, I realized all my fears was false. Mm -hmm. You understand right. me? You know, now me, a brother like me, gonna have a 98.9% track record of success. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. somebody else may have to go through quantity because the yeah. quality might not be there. Mm -hmm. But you can't give up. But if right. you increase the quality, then your percentage rate changes. Right, and if you if you don't have no confidence because you're not used to talking to people physically, yeah. what happens is when these dudes do get offline, their energy is hostile. Yeah. So it's like, hey, what's your name? Well, I got a boyfriend. Well, fuck you then. You right. know? Then it gets real crazy. No and, emotional intelligence. Yeah, then it gets violent. Yeah, that's yeah. a fact. When these dudes don't have no connection, look at the, the, the Dharma thing. Yeah. This dude was antisocial. He mm. didn't know how to socialize. So then it became about control. He had to control everybody he interacted with. And then that control led into murder and you had to, and then it turned into something else. But a lot of people, if you don't know how to interact with people, you want to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you want to control the interaction because you are so insecure, any form of rejection will devastate you emotionally. Yeah. So cats got to get out there and do the trial and error. There's a rite of passage. Sometimes you're going to shoot your shot and hit. Sometimes you're going to get dissed. It happens to the best, but you can't have that fear. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just like and, with boxing, somebody's going to hit you in the face. Right. And they say, once you get hit in the face, you're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can feel that pain, you know what's coming next. Yeah. So, 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 and I say that because it ties into the bigger thing. And when you talk about book breaking, yeah. you know, not having confidence is key, mm -hmm. right? Um, not believing in yourself. Right. You know what I'm saying? Not, not having that faith where anything I think can be manufactured into reality. I meet young men nowadays, they have all of their problems are all mental. Yeah. All of them. And mm -hmm. but then we start to create because mental health is everywhere and it's very real. And it's a lot of mental deficiencies, mm -hmm. things of that nature. But anything that happens in the mind can be solved by the mind. Absolutely. Right. If it's a physical injury, then that's a different reality. Right. Right. But when we talk about most of the issues that young men have, it's mostly just a lack of confidence. Yes, indeed. And belief within self. Mm -hmm. So I really want that to be striked into the hearts, but there's no programming mm -hmm. that is programmed to the confidence of the young male to become a man anymore mm -hmm. because the entire system is anti-man. Right. I believe they are working to make inequalities and traits of masculinity extinct. Mm -hmm. I seen an article where they saying that men should not stand up peeing anymore. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Right. And, and they try to come right. up with reasons and all of these things to say now men should sit down and pee. Mm -hmm. All of those things that are historically masculine, that represent manhood, all of those projections that we used to see on screen, those are disappearing. Yeah. They're being replaced by women. They're being replaced by, you know, smaller figures of men, mm -hmm. right? So you're not getting that brawly masculine, right, man. Yeah. You're not getting the intelligent, Salt problem solver and confident, charismatic, like a James Bond. Right, or, right, right. You know what I'm saying? You're not getting a smooth soul for brother like James Brown. You did. Because, see, we're, we're told as men, men told now are told you have to follow somebody. You need an authoritative yeah. figure, but like the state or the government or somebody in an authoritative position to tell you what to do. Because, see, confidence, man, boils down to one thing mm. trusting yourself. Mm. That's all confidence is. Trusting yourself. I know when I go out here, I'm going to be thorough. Mm. That's all confidence is. A lot of people are so used to somebody telling them what to do, they're not used to telling themselves what to do mm. because I haven't done it. I'm not a good leader. I don't know what I want. I need somebody to tell me what I want. We got to get off that. Mm. Self-determination. Yeah, Self-determination. Once you learn how to trust yourself and you start doing things and accomplishing things on your own without somebody telling you, that's the level of confidence that nobody can teach you. Yes, yes, I like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, first of all, this conversation has been very enlightening. It's and deep. we have a lot of things that we have to take that is ours, mm -hmm. right? Because speaking on that self-determination, I believe that that goes towards the conversation of reparations, because yes, I want to end it on that. Mm -hmm. You know, America, this corporation, they owe us. Yes, they do. The only question is how much. Mm -hmm. That's really it. I always say that. You know, Japan is a great debt holder of America. Mm -hmm. So is China and a few other countries. And, you know, debt is the first form of slavery. Mm -hmm. You understand me? When you owe someone, um, they own you. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say that black Americans are 
the greatest masters because America owes us. Mm -hmm. You understand me? They are beholden to that whether they want to acknowledge it or not. Mm -hmm. And the conversation won't disappear. Right. And we, we're seeing progress being made. And I want our generation who may not be involved in this conversation, may not know the history, right? May not know all of the things on why you are in this situation today. It's not to create a mentality to where you're looking for excuses mm -hmm. and reasons of why you're in this. You talking about your people as a whole. Mm -hmm. And this is why we, we fragment ourselves in individualism and we never look at the whole thing. Well, I'm doing good. Some people say, well, you know, I, this situation is my own fault. And that's definitely the attitude you should take. Yeah. But when it comes to, you know, respecting your ancestors mm -hmm. and honoring your ancestors, you have to get what's owed to them. You understand me? Which is owed to us mm -hmm. because we know through epigenetics that information is carried seven generations. Mm -hmm. So they not seven generations. We not seven generations removed from slavery. We not seven generations removed from black codes right. and Jim Crow and redlining and pipelines to prison. We're not seven generations removed from that. So that is still our bloodline. Yes, it and is. that means that that same epigenetic code is the slave master's children. You all are. Uh, 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 privileging right from our suffering. Mm -hmm. So therefore the only way that we could be one big happy family is if we have equity, yes, we have indeed. ownership, right? We don't just have rights to things, but we are seen as owners of these things. You can't mm -hmm. give me a right to nothing. I'm a human being, I right. have human rights. Mm -hmm. That's why they killed Malcolm X because he talked human rights, right. not just civil rights, mm -hmm. right? And so as human rights, that supersedes civil code, yeah. right? The human code is that these are inalienable natural rights for a human being born. Yeah. And those are things that we haven't even had the benefit of receiving. Right. So one last thing, it's just about FBA yeah. and Africans. Mm -hmm. Some people believe that, you know, it creates a um, separation between the two. Mm -hmm. That some of the content that you put out as, you know, you speak about the histories of blacks, that it creates a wedge between blacks and Africans mm -hmm. and, you know, um, others across the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So is that the intention, right? And do you recognize that? And how do you look toward the future of the relations between foundational black Americans, Africans, and the rest of the diaspora? Mm -hmm. um, to determine or to, to designate our lineage as foundational black Americans, it's just a lineage designation. It's just like saying an African American. Mm -hmm. African American is just too vague because you have people who immigrate over here who are African American, but that doesn't describe us because we didn't immigrate anywhere. We're the only non-immigrant group. You even have white people like Elon Musk who says he's African-American. He was born in Africa, now he's American. Yeah. So technically he's not lying, he's an African-American. African -American. So we are determining our own lineage name, foundational black Americans. Logically that makes more sense. So other groups shouldn't feel bad about that. That's just our lineage, that's all it is. What happens is a lot of people are used to us fighting for them and whenever we accomplish something that gets thrown into the pot of African-American mm. and people can benefit off of it when it's convenient. But when it's something negative, they can distance themselves from us. Or when they do something constructive, they can distance themselves from us. For example, when you have artists and entertainers who win awards or you have somebody who's an immigrant who wins a PhD or who, who earns a PhD, all of a sudden they're Nigerian American. <laughs> you dig? So now yeah. they, they've made a distinction yeah. themselves. Um, Shirley Ralph, I love Shirley Ralph. She just won an Emmy for the first time. That woman has been African-American and black her whole career. The minute she won an Emmy, Jamaican-American actress, yeah. Shirley Ralph won an Emmy. Yeah. So people go out of their way to distance themselves mm. from us. Okay, I get so what So that you're win could go to their lineage. Yeah. But if a Jamaican was over here selling drugs, he's just black. Mm. So if a Nigerian pulls a scam, He's just black. Right. See, we have to absorb all the negative, but then they differentiate themselves with all the positives. So we're saying as Foundation of Black Americans, let's tally up our accomplishments, let's point out our lineage so that we don't absorb everybody else's trash. Right. So they're like, hey, wait a minute, yeah, that's not cool, that's not cool. Yes, it is cool. We are a very unique people and there's nothing wrong with that. Even though we still do have African genetics, you know, 
culturally, we are a different group as foundational black Americans, just like Jamaicans. Jamaicans, yeah. they have African genetics, but they have their specific culture. Right. Haitians have African genetics, but they have their specific culture. So when we say black people created hip hop, we talking about foundational, foundational black, black Americans. Americans. Yes, indeed, because yeah. people are running around trying to tell this lie that um, it was started in the Caribbean. It wasn't. Then they tried to say that the Puerto Ricans started it. Not true. I saw something today. They said that Asians had a part of hip hop. I'm like, wait, how did that happen? Everybody wants a little Everybody piece. Everybody wants man. to get a piece of it now. You yeah, see? I've seen them videos where they were putting out or the, to to counter the narrative that, you know, we've been doing the, uh, we've been rapping. Yeah. Right on beat. We've been dancing, break dancing since the 30s and yes, in the indeed. 20s, and that very specific rhythm of hip hop. You know, and that that particular thing that is known as hip hop today that is spread around the world, mm -hmm. right, is one of those things that is owned right, by foundational black Americans. Mm -hmm. And specifically in that context of understanding how it became successful, right, and where did the contributions come from? Mm -hmm. Because even when there's video showing that some of the famous Caribbean DJs were saying that no, we, yes, we, we got this big speaker box stuff from Americans when we was DJing over there. Right. So we have records of this. Yes, indeed. Right? And people may try to contextualize it to say, well, this wasn't hip hop. This is the influence of hip hop yes, where it, it started. Right. Yes, right. So, you know, no other people suffer from hip hop but us. Mm -hmm. when, right. when we get right. killed, they don't share in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Other All people. Of the, the, the labels, the record labels that were recoded and targeted by the feds, including right. Sugar Hill, Ruthless, Death right. Row rap a lot right we got the the negativity of that right. fighting for the rights of right. everybody else you see in far as far yeah. as hip-hop they don't get no problems but they want ownership exactly if you want to share in something you understand me share in the 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 the, the problems and saying that well we feel like we're a part of this so we want to help y'all mm -hmm. right people only want to take credit for things when there's something good right. but not when they got to fight in that same war exactly all of a sudden we no longer a part of minorities that's a black person issue mm -hmm. you understand me but when it's something that they want to throw themselves in because they said the word minority wait a minute mm -hmm. i'm a minority too mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i like the idea because also it it, it, it places us in this category where I think black people can be proud, yes, right, indeed. of being Americans. Mm -hmm. And that statement right there, I never thought I would say before mm -hmm. until later years that my education has progressed and matured to where I see America as mine. It is. You know, I don't see it as a Absolutely. white man's land. I see it as a native land of our people. Mm -hmm. I see it as a land that we've built and we've suffered, we've bled, and we've given ourselves to, we were the first product of this country. So if there was any place that belonged to us, right, by birthright, by blood right, mm -hmm. it is America. Yes, indeed. And everybody around the world has to respect that. So when you see a black American and they travel around the world, please don't be disrespectful and ask them outside of America where they from. Mm -hmm. Because being from America, for a person that is born here and they have generations of family here that go back hundreds and some go back thousands, mm -hmm. that is enough. Yes, indeed. And there was no United States of America until we built it. That's a fact. We gotta let people know that. Yes, we sir. We built this thing literally from scratch and we cultivated all of the culture of it. Yes, sir. From top to bottom. You know, I applaud you in your mission, Appreciate right, it. to educate us, to give us houses of our history, mm -hmm. and to give us media for our education as well. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, brothers, ladies, you know, there's a list of books I can give you, you know, especially for Nona Balaj Muhammad and things of that nature that you can read. And right alongside of that, I'm gonna give you Hidden Colors. Yes, indeed. You and also, y'all can get my book, um, Foundational Black American Race Bader. I talk about a lot of this stuff in the book and it talks a little bit about my life coming up. So yes, sir. they can get that too. Well, brother, I appreciate this enlightening conversation. Make sure y'all tap in and I hope that you learn a little bit about our hidden history because there's always more to learn. Yes, it has been high-level conversations. Tap in. 19 keys is high-level conversations. Tap in with the dog. I, my experience being on High Level Conversation with our brother Keys, man, is phenomenal. Um, this Bay Area player, and I came up with a lot of Bay Area brothers, man. A lot of the Bay Area dudes laced me with games. So this felt like just being at home, really, 
chopping up with one of those old school cats. And this is a young brother, but he has an old school spirit. You can tell this brother's been laced by some veterans. And it's good to have conversations like that with young brothers who's on his intellectual level. I want to see more young brothers like Brother Keys because when you have elders giving out this kind of knowledge and information, they hope that it's falling on proper ears. They, it's, they hope that the proper people are getting the information and they're gonna translate the information and spread the information in a correct way. Not just using it to debate in circles and, and talk mindlessly. We need people like this brother um, applying the information properly. So I hope other people can see this interview and not only be influenced by what I'm saying, but just be influenced by what Brother Keith is talking about too. Tyree Nasheed is a piece of history. Right, he is a contributor to, you know, um, the identity of black people all across the world, right? I think he is a part of the person that creates the corrections for all of the, you know, errors that were given to us and told to us as history. So I wanted to make sure that we have him because I've been inspired by Hidden Colors, right? One through five, every particular one, right? I've always wanted to be on Hidden Colors. And so now I get to have him on my platform and we get to talk about the hidden history that has not only been and hidden from us, but that's been stole from us. And he has a lot of beautiful projects coming out, like his museum, and he has another project coming out uh, about the Maroons. And I think that each one of these pieces are necessary because some people see Tariq Nasheed as creating division, but I think through this education, he's actually created more unity. Right, because he's giving people their history and it's creating a link between all of us. I think that this fight of his, which is our fight for reparations, is key because we need to keep that on the forefront. There can't be no political movements, there can be no voting for someone without them addressing the issues that are in our communities and that's this economic issues that we face with. So I respect the brother for keeping his foot on people necks, for making sure that what he called a butter biscuits, you understand me, ain't out here running and controlling shit without getting checked. Media is very important. In the interview today, you've heard Brother Keys talk about propaganda. Propaganda is not a bad thing. Propaganda is used every single day. When you go out the house, everything you see, especially as far as advertising, it's all propaganda. You go to the grocery store, you look at the way groceries are set up and the color schemes, that's propaganda. When you see more food that's uh, supposed to be nature type of food, they always have the boxes in green. That's to give you the, uh, the illusion that it's natural. See, they, mind tricks are being played on you all the time, but we can um, give information to each other and propaganda to each other in a positive manner. And media is very important. The, the way you guys have everything set up, man, the professional cameras, the professional lighting, that's very important because it shows that you got heart and integrity in your work. And if you put heart and integrity in your work, the audience can feel that, they can appreciate that. They appreciate when somebody presents something to them uh, on, a, on a beautiful platter. And I think this is a beautiful platter and I think everybody's going to continue to appreciate it and learn from it. You know, if, if I'm looking at reparations, I want it done in incremental stages. I think that for a certain percentage of people who have financial literacy, they have a business plan, they know what they would do with the money, I think it would be great. But for people that are financially illiterate and uneducated, it will end up back into the hands of the very people who have money now because we are a spending people. So I think those people need business plans. They need to have, you know, um, a way towards spending that money, creating a product, creating something that is essential, right? And I think that the money should come with education and it should come in quarters rather than getting one lump sum. If you give any man, you know, whether you're foundational black American and your ancestor has a lineage in slavery, but what if you got a drug problem? Right? What if this person is, is terrible? Whatever it may be, they're only going to fund their habits that they already have. Money is not going to make anybody better. It's only going to enhance and give them more resources to fund the person that they already are. So I think that the rollout plan is as important as the how much, because we need land, we need assets. If you, 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 you give a person, let's say it's a land credit, right? That is a part of a reparation. So let's say that each person gets a million dollars and the part of 10% of that has to be a land credit. So you have to spend a hundred thousand dollars on buying land or buying real estate or starting a business and then you can't sell that land until let's say the next 10 years 
So it ensures that you have equity, you have an asset. So I think that the rollout of reparations should come from the thought leadership that are already thinking about the economic issues and people that are specifically conscious, right, of these issues on an everyday basis. Otherwise, you're going to empower a lot of people, you know, for self-destruction. Peace family, 19 Keys tapping in. We're rolling out something new for all our high level learners that's been tapping in. First of all, we appreciate y'all watching all the videos, getting us millions of views. But now it's time to make sure that you're actually learning and you're educated on these things. So if you see right above me, there's a barcode. If you click that barcode, it's gonna be 19 questions. If you get these questions right, there's gonna be special prizes and privileges and things attached to your education. We call this model learning and earning at the same time, right? If you know and you in a BW, we're constantly learning, we're constantly going over different things, we have these different communities. So what if you can have these type of conversations with our community and different people that's watching? Not just in the chat, but in actual app. So make sure you join BWO, make sure you take the test, and I appreciate you being a high level learner. Tap in.